in the interest of uh, time, I think we'll go to the final speaker, Dr. Peters. Is it on now? There you go. Okay. Um, okay, so I took a little bit of a different tact from my presentation than my predecessors, and I guess actually I was, I was given the task of putting the rest of you guys to sleep since you've now eaten, so I should be able to do a pretty good job of that. But what I did was I actually just took the questions that you asked me and I answered them. So um, I've, I'm going to go through a series of slides, and I thought I'd just, you know, kind of go that route rather than, I saw Paul's and Shauna's and Earl's, and I was, geez, where's their questions? But, you know, you answered them in, indirectly, so I'm going to just go straight through this thing. And here's a real simple slide right here. Um, what's that? Yeah, well, you know, I guess I'm one of these people that like to, I'm very, you know, I'm very, I like to have things just this way, and so, a good, a good scientist. You would know this right, Andreas. Yeah. So the first question was, was there any new evidence that, since the, since the publication of the clonic review, that would suggest that PPR alpha agonists or proximal proliferation will lead to carcinogenesis in humans? And my answer to that is there's really nothing compelling that goes down that road. And, and correct me if someone thinks that I'm wrong, I'd be glad to discuss that with them in greater detail. The second question was, what, is there any new evidence since that publication to support the conclusion that PPR alpha agonists are not likely to pose a cancer risk to humans? Uh, the, the findings from Frank's lab um, with the humanized mouse lines and, and the mechanism that they propose is uh, probably something that might be of, of, of reference of relevance to this question, so I'll, I'll elaborate on this a little bit more later. On the third question posed to me, and now I'm going to get into a little bit more detail on these slides, and so what I did here was I kind of, you guys, I'm not sure who put these together, but they were multiple, these questions had lots of questions within them, so I tried to just, I underline the question that I'm answering this one here. It relates to the ETO paper in 2007 that uh, you know, the, Na the National Academy of Science a panel addressed as well, and that was the, that the DEHP caused liver tumors in PPR alpha null mice, and the, the question was whether or not these authors suggest that PPR alpha independent mode of action, and how do these findings affect the conclusion from the clonic review that PPR alpha agonists are not likely to pose a cancer risk to humans? And so my, my interpretation of the ETO paper, or, or the, to, the, to answer this question, is it raises questions, that's for certain, and it definitely raises questions about whether or not this, this is a, a, uh, an independent mode of action for DEHP. Um, I think there's limitations to the paper, and I'm not going to go into a little bit of de de to too much detail there, but I'm a little bit concerned about the lack of dose response and that there's no consistent dose-dependent changes in liver tumors, in, the, in, in particular in the wild-type mice. And I bring that to your attention because they really only found those effects primarily in the null mice. And we've had this discussion a little bit, and I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on this right now, and that is that the, the phenotype of the PPR alpha null mouse may not be relevant to humans in the sense that there are no known polymorphisms in PPR alpha that make a protein or code for a protein that has no activity. But there are known polymorphisms in PPR alpha that, that lead to an enhanced activity of a receptor. And the, the functional significance of that polymorphism in terms of what it does and why people might that have that might be different than others that don't um, is, is uncertain. Some papers report different activities associated with it, but it's never been clearly determined. And whether or not that has anything to do with cancer risk has never been examined as well. But for sure, there's no example of a PPR alpha protein that has no activity. So the, no the knockout mouse model really lacks expression of this, of this protein, it's very, it, and it serves a, functional, a very important ser fu functional role in mice as well as in humans. So the, the phenotype that they found in that DEHP model, I'm trying to, to, to get to the point here, is that the knockout mice develop liver tumors with age. That's known. Chris Corton reported that a, a number of years ago, and a couple of other groups have as well. It's most likely the fact that there is lipid accumulation in the liver, and we know that Hepatic lipid accumulation is known to be negatively associated with liver cancer. It's a, it's a causal risk factor for liver cancer, independent. So that's something that happens as well. And there's also known to be enhanced inflammation due to the fact that PPR alpha has epigenetic activities. It interacts with NF-kappa B, for example, and it prevents inflammation from progressing. And so w coupled with this in, in increased lipid accumulation and the enhanced inflammatory anti-inflammatory activity, or I should say in increased inflammation, <laughs> The trend for more liver tumors in the null mouse model could reflect an entirely different mode of action. And it may not be relevant to humans in the sense that we, we all have PPR alpha, and it does what it's supposed to do because we just ate. You've got to burn fat when you eat. When you eat. So or I shouldn't say right now. Actually, you're going to be using your PPR alpha in about three hours from now when you're starving, and you need to mobilize fat and burn it for energy. So we all have it for a reason. And in that sense, 
this model may not be relevant. This is not found when PPR alpha is present. So in the wild type mouse model in the DEHP study from ETO, there was really no consistent increases in liver tumors found in those mice. So I draw the question, I mean, you could interpret those findings. It was never been interpreted that PPR alpha could actually protect against liver cancer in this situation. So it's kind of a, you have to think about what they're, what they're talking about there and whether or not this is independent mode of action for DEHP. So it remains possible, though, we're getting to another question, that there is more than one mo MOA for DEHP, including the PPR alpha mode of action, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. But keep in mind that if that were true, I would argue that it's perhaps relevant, it's, it's pr probably linked to the fact that there is no PPR alpha expressed in those null mice, and therefore that the MOA in that particular model may be entirely different. And you guys can wrestle with that when you go to, to interpret your, go to your findings there. <laughs> the second part of this question was, um, is it plausible that some PPR alpha agonists may induce tumor genesis by a PPR alpha independent mode of action as proposed by Chris Corton's group, I believe this paper was. And the answer to that one is yes, it's definitely plausible. Um, but it doesn't rule out the possibility that the established PPR alpha mode of action can also be central for, a central mode of action for any given chemical. So, and I, I, I put up there that it's difficult to reconcile how a PPR alpha knockout mouse does not develop liver tumors in response to long-term exposure to PPR alpha agonists without accepting the notion that PPR alpha is required to mediate the hepatocarcinogenic effect of these, of these chemicals. I mean, it's just, it's impossible to reconcile that. I mean, PPR alpha is clearly required some seminal work by some pretty famous guy back in the decades ago, um, or centuries ago, sorry, did some studies that showed that. And I think that it's, it's something to k keep in mind. Be so can there be an independent mode of action? I think there can be for some of these chemicals. And DEHP may or may not fall into that category. And it may have something to do with the fact, getting back to the ETO paper, that you have no PPR alpha present, in which case then some other mode of action might kick in. Now, one of the things that Chris has postulated that is that whether or not um, CAR is involved. And that's, I mean, Kurt Omachinsky is actually the first to show that a phthalate could actually activate CAR. It's, it's actually, it's one of the CAR variants. It's a molecular pharmacology paper that came out a couple, I think it was about a year or two ago. And so there's been some speculation that DEHP may be functioning through CAR. And I thought I'd throw this, sh show, show this slide up here that, yeah, CAR is involved in hyperplasia. It's known to be required to mediate the, some of these carcinogenic effects of some compounds like phenobarb and TC bobop. But what this slide shows is that in the knockout mice, you don't, I think this thing, oh, here we go. In the knockout mice here, you don't get hyperplasia in response to these CAR agonists where you do in the wild type mice. But I also draw your attention to the fact that it's also well known that, that CAR activity is also known to exhibit species differences. So you can have great differences in the response. So for example, TC bobop, where you get enhanced activity here for, for the mouse CAR analog, you don't get so much activity for the human. Uh, phenobarb is kind of about the same, and Anderson here, you, you actually see the exact opposite of that. So you need to keep that in mind as well, that if you're going to think and wrestle with the idea that CAR is involved with DEHP type activities, you also have to figure that there could be some, sp some species differences there as well. Okay, question 4A was, and they, they, you talked about the, the humanized mouse model, and you actually asked about the Yang paper. That's actually, I wanted to clarify something from, from the, this long uh, question that you asked was, the Yang paper was actually the second of, it was the third paper of, of three papers that have come out. The first two are actually much earlier than that, and that was the 2004 paper and the 2006. The 2004 was the initial characterization of the humanized mouse model that was for the liver-specific expression of the human receptor. And then the Mori, Morimura paper in carcinogenesis in 2006, that was a liver-specific, that's the liver cancer paper. That's the only one that's been done with liver cancer. The Yang paper really dealt more with hyperplasia and sort of things like that. It did nothing to do with the liver cancer. So I believe you were talking about the, the former paper here in the middle, of the Morimura paper, when you asked these questions. So, and they're kind of all related. So what your question was is that since you get, um, you get what you end up getting is you end up getting lipid catabolism being regulated inside the, in what we call the humanized mouse model, but you don't get changes in cell proliferation occurring. And what does that mean? And so that's what those two studies, or that's what those studies could be. So the, what the, the, the question here was, how do these studies support the conclusion of Klonig that p -pair alpha agonists are not likely to pose a cancer risk to humans? So probably the most important thing to take home from those studies is that they demonstrate that the human p -pair alpha in a, in a mouse model modulates lipid catabolism that is the basis for the ongoing therapeutic use of fibrates, which have been used for many, many years. That demonstrates functionality of this receptor in, in vivo model. And so I think that you can take home that that receptor is functioning very quite similarly to what you would see in a human in the fact that you get regulation of lipid catabolism, you get changes in lipids that are, are beneficial in, in, in humans, and you see the same thing in a mouse model. Demonstrating that the activating the human p alpha in a mouse that does not cause liver cancer after chronic treatment with one p alpha agonist 
which is known to cause um, liver cancers through these PPR alpha dependent mechanisms. That's, th that's an actually f a fairly um, important observation. And so the most likely explanation for this is differences in activity that could be differences to differences in molecular targets as well as differences in transcriptional cofactor recruitment. So the mechanism that was worked out for the species difference that Yatrik Shah did when he was at the NIH is shown by this slide here. So you all know that we don't really know how you get mutations in DNA in response to proxen proliferators. It's, they're non-genotoxic carcinogens, and this has been a, a big gray area for a number of years. But we do know that there has to be some mutation or some muta mutational event that occurs um, that, that, that leads to cancer. So what, what, they, what Yatrick found was that using this humanized mouse model, actually was the first thing he did is he actually discovered that this LET7C microRNA cluster here, which in turn regulates uh, proteins like the MYC oncogene, when, when this is downregulated in response to activation of this receptor, PPR alpha, you get downregulation of this LET7C microRNA, which leads to an upregulation of CMIC expression, which drives expression of the cell cycle. And through that mechanism, you get increases in tumors. And so that, that, that's the postulated mechanism. So in mouse model, mouse PPR alpha regulates lipid catabolism as well as cell proliferation. And this was a fairly you know, convincing argument that this is what's causing it. We, we, we knew that cell cycle was progressing in mouse models for years. We knew that proteins like cyclins and CDKs were all upregulated. We could not figure out for the life of us what, we knew that they weren't direct PPR alpha target genes. We went down all these things looking, we could never figure out what, what was driving it. And it turns out it was a microRNA or a microRNA cluster that was actually regulating expression of these oncogenes and that's what was driving progression. So that paper, this was, this was a secondary paper to the humanized study. This also used humanized mice here as well. Kind of set up the, the framework for what the, what the working hypothesis is to explain the humanized, or the, the differences between humans. Because if you look at this, this mechanism in the humanized mouse model, they found that you do not get this change in LET7C microRNAs, and you do not get the, the liver tumors. And so this is putatively the mechanism for the species difference between mice and humans, or between rodents and humans. Now I would argue though that you still need to check this out in other human models. But this is clearly where people are moving in this direction, trying to, to validate that this is what's going on in other human models. And once that's done, I think that you can establish fairly conclusively that this is what, what potentially could explain why humans appear to be refractory. I mean, fib rates have been used for many, many, many years, and they're just the, 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 the if they were causing liver cancer, by now you'd think 40, 50 years later that they, people would be taking these things at the market, and that's really not the case. So there's a pretty strong case that, that there is a species difference, at least for fib rates. So, can these studies be interpreted as evidence for PPR alpha independent cancer modes of action in humans, as suggested by the Guyton Review in 2009? So the arguments presented by Guyton suggest that the Mori Murrah study was limited because the number of mice were only exposed for 38 weeks, there was mortality in the wild type mice, there was a small number of animals study, and the human PPR alpha may not function the same in the mouse due to differences in tra transcriptional cofactor recruitment. You got to, you know, these are legitimate potential arguments of why there's differences between them. Um, but you've got to get down to the, the bottom line, and that is how does one explain the lack of tumors in humanized mice expressing the, that response to ligand activation by, by regulating lipid catabolism? So you recognize that you are getting one functional role of this receptor to occur in these animals. So these are, are reasonable um, uh, criticisms one can point out, but you still have to kind of come to grips with why these mice don't get liver tumors, and, and that receptor does appear to function. So the humanized mice don't really provide com compelling evidence of a PPR alpha independent mode of action in humans, but more importantly, their argument for the PPR alpha independent mode of action was really based on two papers. And one of them was the ETO paper, which we just described, so I'm not going to go into details on that one. But more importantly, it was this paper from Qin Yang in Frank's lab, and that was published in 2007. And what they did there is they showed that there was a lack of change in hepatic cell proliferation despite increased expression of lipid catabolizing enzymes in a transgenic mouse that expressed a VP16 PPR alpha fusion protein. So the conclusion that Guyton drew from that was that PPR alpha activation by this fusion protein is not sufficient to induce hepatic carcinogenesis. So these data therefore are inconsistent with the hypothesis that the effects mediated through PPR act activation constitute a complete MOA for carcinogenesis. There's a major problem with this interpretation, and I'll point that out in the next slide. So PPRs are ligand activated transcription factors that respond to ligands by undergoing conformational changes in the protein structure. They, re they dissociate from co-repressors, they, re they recruit co-activators, scaffolding proteins, RNA polymerase, and they sit down on target genes and they increase expression of target genes. So these interactions with other proteins and, and the, folding of the, pro uh, the folding of the protein itself are major factors dictating how these PPRs are going to function. 
So for example, um, the ligand has a major role in modulation of receptor function. I put up here triglitazone or resilin, as many of you remember, which caused liver failure. It killed a number of people. That was the first glitazone, the PPR gamma agonist on the market, versus pioglitazone, which is Actos, the good one that you've been reading about in the newspaper, not Rosie, which you've been hearing so much bad stuff about. And so here you see an example of two compound or two ligands that elicit significantly different biological responses. But, and part of the reason they think is that because that there are differences in, in the recruitment of different coactivators. So you have to think about ligands interacting with the receptor. These are the kinds of things that are going on. So the argument that, that was put forth by Guyton was that, well, the, the fact that those mice don't get increases in cell proliferation, the VP16 fusion protein mice, tells you that, w that, that this receptor is not causing increases in cell proliferation. There's something wrong with that MOA. There's a major problem with that. And here, here on the next two slides, I'll kind of illustrate this pretty nicely for you, I think. So the, the, the fusion protein does not, in, does not equal an endogenous PPR alpha. So this was the protein that Frank's lab made. They took a viral VP16 transactivation domain. Forget about that response element up there. It, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's there. But what's more important is they fused it to the PPR alpha cDNA. Well, this transactivation domain of the VP16 is, is entirely different with the way it works. And so I'm not going to get into this description here, what they do, but basically there are a number of proteins that interact with that the VP16 transactivation domain relies on to, to activate transcription. It's totally different than what you see in response to a ligand interacting with a receptor. That protein's totally different. You don't have the conformational changes. There's some things that go on there. So the lack of change in cell proliferation in the VP16 fusion PPR alpha transgenic mice could simply reflect differences in the ability of this protein to modulate targets that can regulate cell proliferation. It may just not be able to, tar to target the LET7C microRNAs. That's, that could be a key step. But more importantly, I draw your, so this is a classic example we use in one of the classes we teach up at Penn State. It's a good example for biochemists to understand that you cannot take a protein and, and draw these two conclusions. You're comparing apples and oranges. The viral VP16 transactive ocean domain was used to make a fusion protein um, with the myOD transcription factor. The myOD transcription factor is a muscle transcription factor that modulates differentiation. It has a transactivation domain similar to PPAR. It's not the same one, but it basically functions the same way. What this group did is they actually took the VP16 transactivation domain, fused it to myOD, kind of the same analogy they did with PPAR alpha, okay? And they took this protein, they said, well, what does it do? So they replaced this that with, well, it turns out that that fusion protein, oops, it transactivates myOD reporters, it turns on target genes, okay? But it doesn't induce myogenesis. Okay, so what it shows you is the fusion protein transcription factor doesn't act like endogenous transcription factor. Here you have another, it's the same exact thing where you have an analogous system set up before with the transactivation domain of fusion protein where you get modulation of some targets, but when you actually look at the end product, the, the terminal differentiation of the skeletal target genes, you don't. So you have two different, two different comparisons. And so to draw the comparison by saying that the VP16 fusion protein doesn't, uh, in, the tr in the PPAR alpha mouse, doesn't cause increases in cell proliferation, therefore de diminishes the, moto the MOA for PPAR alpha, you can't do that. You, cannot, you cannot make that comparison because it's comparing apples and oranges. And until you could work those things out, you can't do that. So that's a problem with that interpretation. So getting back to the question at hand, it's kind of a long drawn out. Can you take the, the, the humanized studies and, and argue that they demonstrate for a PPAR alpha independent mode of action? My answer to that question is no. They certainly draw some questions about it, but they don't definitively demonstrate that there is no functional MOA. So that argument really doesn't hold water. Question number five was, many phthalates are capable of activating both murine and human, PPR alpha and PPR gamma. Are PPR alpha and PPR gamma required for or contribute to the toxic effect of phthalates and rodents, including, and they went down this laundry list. So what I tried to do here was I split it into two different things, and I'm going to talk about PPR gamma first. You asked about cancer. I'll tell you it's highly unlikely. There are ongoing chemopreventive and chemotherapeutic studies in humans. They, these things have been going on for years because we know that targeting PPR gamma prevents tumor genesis. It's been, the efficacy is a little bit dubious, but in, in fact, there are ongoing clinical trials right now to this day examining this. So the, the, whether or not PPR gamma causes cancer, highly unlikely. Liver toxicity, that's uncertain. It's never really been examined in no mice. Um, there is some evidence that you get increased lipid accumulation with PPR gamma agonists. It's typically, but PPR gamma is actually usually typically very low in the liver. Um, and there's also some evidence of hepatoprotective effects um, due to anti-inflammatory activities of PPR gamma and the, and, and the agonists themselves. Kidney toxicity, again, uncertain. There's never been examined in no mice. Reproductive and developmental effects. 
There was some work done down at NIEHS. I, the, the name is slipping my mind right now, but she, it was a woman's group that she showed that MEHP and some PPR gamma agonists could actually inhibit aromatase activity in, in rat granulosa cells and that an antagonist mitigates this effect. But there's no evidence to date of developmental toxicity due to PPR gamma agonists in the literature that I'm aware of. So I don't know if that's going to be a problem. Other health endpoints, I'm going to address that later on another slide. And then for PPR alpha, the question, same kind of tumor, tumor endpoints, you talked about PPR alpha with cancer. I think there's a clear role for PPR alpha in liver cancer, but other mechanisms can't be clearly ruled out for all, for all compounds. I mean, but clearly there is data for that. For uh, pancreatic acinar cell tumors and Leydig cell tumors, I think there's an unclear role. I'm not going to get into the details there, but whether or not PPR alpha is involved, that's been kind of all over the place here. Other tumors, it's really never been examined particularly in great detail. For liver toxicity, and here's just another slide. This is a slide I'll use some, some data from uh, Jerry Ward's paper uh, where he looked at liver toxicity, and there's really just hyperplasia, or hyper, I should say cyto cyto hepatocytomegaly, where if you look in the wild-type mice, you get enlarged hepatocytes and proximal proliferation. You don't get these effects. It's similarly treated people off of knockout mice. These mice were treated with DEHP. So there is some evidence for DEHP that liver toxicity is mediated through this receptor. Kidney toxicity gets a little bit more grainy here. You got yes and no. So this study was done. Jerry hit him with a whopping dose of DEHP. And, and essentially what happened in the study is most of the wild-type mice died after, I think it was about, uh, somewhere after 16 weeks. They didn't live very long. So in this study, he kept the knockout mice around longer. I'm not quite sure why, but he did. And, uh, and he, he looked at the tissues, looked at some pathology. So if you look at kidney toxicity, after four weeks in the, of DEHP feeding, he finds ne nephropathy, focal tubular degeneration, atrophy. He sees a number of things that are found only in wild-type mice, but not in knockout mice. So after short-term treatment with DEHP, there's clearly PPR alpha-dependent changes in the kidney. Then as you go on, after 8 to 16 weeks, you get these things, cystic renal tubules, and th this effect was diminished in PPR alpha knockout mice as well. So you still have these early events that are occurring that are clearly a component as PPR alpha dependent. But then after 24 weeks, you get severe nef nephropathy in the PPR alpha knockout mice, but he, didn't, he wasn't able to compare this to the wild type because they'd all died. So there's something there going on where you, you are getting a pathology that's independent of the receptor, and this has been seen in other tissues as well, so I'll show you in the next couple of slides. So these are reproductive developmental effects. Again, getting back to um, Paul's um, talk, th these doses are really, really high. But if you look inside the mice, after eight weeks of feeding, you basically have no spermatogenesis in most tubules in the wild-type mice. Um, and, and, and after eight weeks, of, in, in, you on, in only a few tubules where you get normal spermatogenesis is not found in PPR alpha knockout mice. But if you look way down the road, 24 weeks later, you get a, a distinct pathology here in, 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 in the um, the tubules inside the knockout mice that, that was, again, indicative that, 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 that there are effects of phthalates that are not dependent on this receptor. And that's, that's essentially the title of this paper is that we're talking about independent and, and dependent effects of the receptor. So Jerry was with. And this is a paper, again, that was done about another century ago when I was a wild postdoc trying, you know, just dreaming up things to look at. And we were trying to look at whether or not the receptor was required for the developmental toxicity of phthalates. And again, here, we found that DEHP-induced developmental toxicity was essentially similar in wild-type and knockout mice. This was, this was presented at the teratology meeting a, a number of years ago, and, 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 and there was really no difference. The thing to take from this one, though, is that the dose that we treated them with was along the line, it was somewhere between 500 to, a, I think it might have even been 1,000 milligrams per kilogram. So it was very, very high, and it was associated with maternal toxicity as well, just as Paul pointed out. But there again, so there's no, there was no uh, dependent effect here uh, in terms of PPR-alpha in that phenotype. Okay, so, and then the question, I think I'm on to question six now. Yep, so here's question six, and this was a tough one, so I'm getting more and more vague with the tougher ones because I really didn't know how to quite handle some of these questions here. Um, whether PPR alpha or PPR gamma induce a difference, so what are the implications of interspecies differences in PPR function regarding human health risk? I mean, that's, that's a question that, you know, I wish I could just say, oh, this is what it is, but we really can't get to that right now. So whether PPR alpha, though, and PPR gamma induce a different suite of genes, as you guys suggested, in humans versus rodents, that may be overstated. I mean, you have to think about that too, because there's also, there's differences that probably do exist, and there are probably differences that exist for different agonists. But there's also very many similarities. For example, the basis for modulating lipid metabolism by fibrates occurs in both species. 
And similarly, you get modulation of glucose homeostasis, which is the basis of thiazolidine dions, which is the basis of the PPR gamma agonist. So there is clearly overlap as well. So is there overlap? Is there, are they totally you know, diametrically different? It's possible. So I think you're going to have to deal with interspecies differences that are due to a number of different things that could have to do with the receptor itself, which may be the case for PPR alpha and liver cancer, distribution of the receptor, cofactors in different tissues, response elements, and then epigenetic differences, which we don't know about, which you don't, I mean, that's, and that's a clear thing. And in fact, there is examples of PPR alpha agonists modulating epigenetic activities, uh, Yvonne Racine, and I'm trying to remember the other guy there at Duke, um, uh, who, who's, who, who's the epigenetic guy, you must know. Randy Jurdle, yeah, I mean, that classic stuff like that. So he's shown this as well. So there's clear examples of the, the, that these things kind of things might, might take effect. And so you have to keep this in mind. So I didn't answer your question very good, but I can tell you that that's something you should think about. Um, are adverse effects in rodents mediated by PPR alpha and PPR gamma relevant to humans? Again, it's going to be context, dis context dependent. Um, you minimally require data sets from either knockout or knockdown experiments, and you need to demonstrate the requirement of the receptor, as well as you need to have strong data sets from human for, com for comparative purposes. So I use the example of fibrates because you have a fairly strong weight of evidence that at least some PPR alpha agonists, the fibrates, that liver cancer is observed in rodents is probably not relevant in humans. Okay? Other examples are a little bit less clear, like for pancreatic acid cell tumors, latex cell tumors, I'm not going to go down that road. Uh, PPR gamma dependent increase in osteoclast activity is found in mice, and that correlates very well with decreased bone mass observed in some humans that are treated with PPR gamma agonists. So that some toxicity, so that's another example of one where you've got toxicity that does correlate pretty well with humans. Um, some toxicities are found in humans following exposure to PPR agonists. They're not always seen in rodent models. So congestive heart failure is something that's associated with PPR gamma agonists. It is not necessarily modeled well in, in rodent models. So those are examples. So you go all the way across the board where you've got them, yes, no, maybe so, and you can take it from there. Okay, and then you asked me what, what's that? Oh. <laughs> you asked me what's known about the function of PPR gamma in humans. This was an easy one because I like to give history lessons. So Peter Tontineau's from Bruce Spiegelman's group was the first one to show what, these, what, this, what this receptor does. He showed that activating PPR gamma causes fibroblasts to differentiate into adipocytes. That was the first evidence to demonstrate that PPR gamma actually promotes terminal differentiation of adipocytes. I mean, I could take you back even further and tell you how they identified that, that, that receptor, but it, they, they were, they were, it, it wasn't a stretch for them to go down this road because they, they clone it from a gene that was involved in adipogenesis. So that's what it does. Um, what they do know is that, it's, that, that, that the regulation of a number of targets in adipose, they think, um, and I'm not going to go into the list of these target genes, but when you activate PPR gamma and you upregulate expression of these target genes, these changes in gene expression are thought to be the basis for the hypoglycemic effect induced by thiazolidine dions. And so if you delete the receptor in adipose, you, you diminish this response. So adipose is, primary, is, one of the, is thought to be one of the primary targets. But again, I can tell you that this is very much a gray area. They know that gamma agonists work to reduce serum glucose levels, but really uh, the specific mechanisms in which tissues it's working on, because skeletal muscle is probably going to be something else where it functions, they really don't know the answer to that. But they do know what it does. Um, there are, as people, as I mentioned earlier, ongoing clinical trials looking at the efficacy of chemo prevention. And that's due to the fact that if you turn on PPR gamma in, in cancer cells, you can induce terminal differentiation, you can inhibit cell proliferation, you can e increase apoptotic signaling. Some of these through PPR gamma, I, sh I should say, receptor dependent as well as receptor independent activities. So that's known to occur. Um, PPR gamma, like most of the, all the PPRs, they have potent anti-inflammatory activities through a mechanism called transrepression. Be glad to talk about that in greater detail as well. That's another known function for PPR gamma. It's, no, it's been shown to inhibit differentiation of a number of T cells, and that's thought to, and that's, that's the reference down here at the bottom. This reference is for that paper right there. Might be used to inhibit autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis. So there's a number of um, uh, functional roles for PPR gamma described in literature, but one of the things that's also associated with are adverse side effects, the toxicities, which you asked me about as well. So I mentioned hepatotoxicity with resulin earlier. Uh, that's, a, that's one of the known side effects with one particular PPR gamma agonist. Fluid retention, which may occur through regulation of a, of a, uh, a kidney-specific epithelial sodium channel transporter, which may contribute to the edema, which is also associated with the, these compounds. Weight gains also might be due to some of these things here, as well as the adipogenic potential of these compounds. A congestive heart failure is a big one that you, you all have heard about what's happened to rosy glitters in the last few weeks. Uh, and bone fractures, which maybe some of you hadn't heard about, and that's due to increased osteoclast activity. So these are known adverse side effects associated with thiazolidine dions or PPR gamma agonists, and they really don't know. I mean, aside from, 
I'd say that they used to think that, that, they, that this edema and the fluid retention and weight gain might have been due to this regulation of this protein, but it turns out that that study may be not so reproducible and so people aren't so, they're not so convinced that they've got that mechanism worked out either. Um, are there any, I'm getting down here the last couple slides here, and these are pretty easy because I didn't really know how to answer these questions very well for you. Previous, you asked, are there other cancer sites that the CHAP should consider in risk assessment of phthalates such as pancreas or testes? Um, we used, I was on this CHAP 10 years ago, we used mononuclear cell leukemia for DINP, I believe, and uh, you're welcome to look at that literature. I don't know that you're going to be looking at PACs or LCTs. I mean, there's, there's been arguments put forward that PPR alpha activity is associated with the generation of these, with these tumor types, but I'm not really quite sure if that species difference has been demonstrated conclusively. Um, I'd probably yield that question to Paul, who probably has a little bit better experience with all of his bioassays that he's been looking at this thing for the last century. He probably knows more about the different tumor types that are found with all the different phthalates than I do because, you know, as you can see, I'm a little bit younger than Paul, but. <laughs> and then lastly, are you aware of any ongoing studies that might be helpful to the chap? Um, we have an ongoing bioassay in my, in my lab going on right now that you might be interested in hearing about real quickly in that we're, we're using this super duper PPR alpha agonist that's, that's highly specific for the human receptor, not the mouse. So Wyeth has greater affinity for the mouse receptor than the human. So we've got this one compound that has a very, it's nanomolar you know, affinity for the human receptor, and we have a bioassay going on, and, and we're using the wild type to knock out the humanized mice for this. And we're also doing it kind of an, as, as an aside in the same experiment, we're dosing uh, neonates um, uh, when, they're, when they're first born to see if there's a difference in sensitivity between young versus old, because there's some interest in that as well. I've heard that there's also long-term bioassays going on with DEHP, but I'm not really quite sure about the specifics of that one as well. And with that, um, I've taken up my half an hour of time. I'll yield to questions. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Well, I'll, I'll, for, first of all, mo most of the, or I, I'm to blame for a lot of the questions, especially the ones directed to you. Um, in, I, I think the question about uh, number six, where, you know, the human relevance, uh, I guess my question is, or what I was really thinking is if, if some of the effects in rodents are mediated by PPAR alpha, um, that uh, um, doesn't necessarily mean that they're not relevant to humans. Uh, just because, it, you know, if the liver tumors are not likely relevant to humans, um, doesn't necessarily mean that any other effects are not relevant. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I'm not sure we can all, we, we can answer that question right yeah. now today. I mean, but there's no, I mean, you can't automatically uh, apply the same logic without well, a whole, I knowing a whole lot more. Yeah, I mean, I think that you, you can and you can. I think that you can take the logic that, I mean, what, what's been applied to that globally, I think it was tried, they, they tried, we tried to do that with PACT and LCTs way back when yeah. too. And it, it, I think the problem with that was that um, the database for uh, the mechanistic information we had at the time was minimal. Yeah. And that was the problem. And I think that's the problem you're going to kind of grap grapple with here is that right. you're, you don't have a date. See, with, with liver cancer, it's pretty rich. And in particular, like with the fibrates, for example, we've got a huge human population. We've got tons of studies done in you know, human cells and, and, and even humans. You know, we've got good human, relatively decent human data. Yeah. Um, uh, even better than what Shauna can get because they get, you know, liver weight and things like that. So I think that you have, uh, there there's a little bit better potential. But so I don't think that you can, so, so to answer your question then, um, I understand the logic behind that and you probably could do that if you had a stronger data set. Yeah. I guess my other question, uh, Shauna earlier uh, mentioned a study uh, that implicated phthalates uh, or associated phthalates with metabolic syndrome yeah. in humans. Uh, on the other hand, you have gam PPAR gamma agonists that are used to treat type 2 diabetes. So this is, are those two conflicting? Yeah, that, yeah, that didn't, yeah, it, it, that, yeah absolutely. Um, actually, all the PPR agonists, PPR alpha, PPR beta delta, and PPR gamma agonists, 
all of them are targeted for metabolic syndrome for various aspects of them. So yeah. PPR alpha is the dyslipidemias, uh, PPR beta delta is for the glucose regulation as well as the fat burning potential. Um, and PPR gamma is the glucose regulation as well. And all three of them for their anti-inflammatory activities, which has also <laughs> been shown to have effects in the macrophages and the, adipo and the adipose of people that, are, that suffer from metabolic syndrome. There's a relationship with, with that activity. So the fact that phthalates may or may not be associated, I would say that they, they were associated with metabolic syndrome would, wouldn't have, it would not be um, consistent with the notion yeah. that it's functioning through a PPR dependent mechanism. Well, th thank you very much for a, a great talk. Any other questions? Lily. So it was it was actually really on the the pancreatic acinar cell tumors and elytic cell tumors, uh, and you know, as you uh, I think as you know, Jeff, you know, you don't get those in mice, right? <laughs> and that's a real problem with regard to the knockout kind of thing that they're that you see them in rats and um so i think i, I would absolutely agree with you that, you know the evidence that that's ppr alpha mediate is fluffy to to say the least in terms of the mechanistic information and i think the other thing is the only time you ever see latex cell tumors in mice is usually due to an estrogen activity and i think as as earl mentioned earlier the way you actually diagnose latex cell tumors in <coughs> rodents compared to humans uses very different diagnostic criteria. So in rodents, it's based on seminiferous tubule diameters. Um, it's either one or three diameters. Actually, it doesn't really matter because they're usually that big that you can see them. Uh, in humans, they don't do it. And so when you actually go and look at, as Earl alluded to, some of the data that's come out of testicular biopsies in uh, subfertile men in Denmark, they actually have what they call Leydig cell micronodules in a lot of these men. And if that was in a rodent, it would be a Leydig cell adenoma. In other words, if you applied the rodent diagnostic criteria, you would, be call, you would call it an, an adenoma, but that's not what's used by the pathologists of human disease. So there's a... At one time, we thought Leydig cell tumours were very, very rare um, in humans, and actually it, te it seems that it's really the malignant tumours that are very, very rare in humans humans as they are in rodents. I've only ever seen two in 25 years. And also they're not necessarily associated with any endocrinopathy and that's true in both rats and humans. So I think there's those those tumour types are not quite as different as uh, we once thought. And also the DHP bioassays, yeah the NTP is doing one but starting with in utero exposure. Oh you, oh, you guys are? Yeah. Okay, good. yeah. I, I thought there was one going on. Yeah. Uh, maybe you know, it must have been you that told me that. I probably was. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it, but I didn't. Any other comments, questions? Not hearing any. We, we have some time before we're scheduled to go on with the next presentations. Um, does the committee want to delve into other issues while we still have uh, these three speakers with do us? We, do we want to just quickly review our critical issues uh, and see if that uh, prompts any more questions? Uh, you, have, you obviously have it there. Why don't you go ahead and go through those? Okay. Well, this won't. This won't take too long, and I guess the the first question was, what are the really important endpoints? It, I mean, is it the male developmental effects, or is it should we be also looking at cancers and other uh, uh, chronic organ toxicities and so on? And I don't. Does anyone want to comment on that? Paul said yes. Uh, I mean, I think we feel that the developmental alterations in the male rat from the androgen alteration are the sort of the low dose effects. But yeah. I think it's important to consider all of the other effects as well. Effects in the female during pregnancy and the F1 female and the cancer. Uh, 
I mean, if, if one decides for some reason that the male reproductive effects or an androgen pathway isn't relevant, you still have all these other effects that are clearly not mediated to that pathway. Uh, and, and I think it also puts in perspective the fact that of the mechanism of toxicity of the phthalates is not a simple inhibition of steroidogenesis. So I would, I mean, I would see the male endpoints now as critical unless they're deemed irrelevant, and then but the other important to consider too. Okay. And I think you also have to consider the exposure as well, you know, because I think what we try to say that you could induce these effects on reproductive development in a fairly narrow critical window of development and that's not necessarily going to be true for the other toxicities so you know yeah. are you talking about you know low dose long term chronic exposure where some of those other endpoints might be become more important one question along those lines is i guess what do we think is the window in human the susceptible window in humans? I mean, is it could it be that as short as one day can have an effect, or you know, do we have to assume that that may be the case? Well, we certainly can get malformations with one day exposure in a rodent, um, but as I, I tried to illustrate, you don't get the complete yeah. suite of effects. So, you know, and we know the period of sexual differentiation in humans. It's first trimester, maybe just over into the, into the second. Um, so it's, I think it's from like week eight to 15 or something like that. So that's the that would be the critical window in a human for if those effects were to occur in humans. I guess number two, uh, what, what are the relevant populations we should be looking at? I mean, we know obviously the, the fetus uh, is a sensitive target, the infant, and so on. Um, and because of the fetus, we want to estimate exposure to the mothers. Uh, are there any other susceptible populations that we're overlooking, um, or other than the general population? Any others that we know of, or you know of? There are no, well, for example, no uh, uh, PPAR uh, um, allotypes, whatever, uh, uh, that are, have no activity, for example. So there, there really aren't any uh, populations that we know of that might be extra sensitive to phthalates. No one's really looked at that. Yeah, that's that's the one mutation. Yeah, the L one six two V. I don't know that. Um, I don't know that that would increase sensitivity okay. of, of of liver cancer or not. I think that's something that we've yeah. mentioned in our reviews before. But yeah, I think that I think that the to, the to the question though about the low dose kind of, I think you have to be very careful about the. I think there's really clear evidence that if you go back to the literature that there are PPR alpha dependent effects in the liver that occur at higher concentrations and that the ETO paper suggests that there's independent events and keep that into context with that that there are no mutations in PPR alpha that are that have a, a protein that doesn't function so that yeah. low dose exposure I in my opinion may or, it, it, the, the relevance of that to the human population may be less so than at the higher doses where you, you would go to a PPR alpha MOA, and, and the lower doses may be independent, but it, it may not be even relevant. Um, and I, I guess, uh, let's see. As far as the phthalates, which ones are essential to, that we need to look at in our cumulative risk assessment? Um, obviously, the, the active ones um, do you think that should include methyl and ethyl, or? <laughs> Based on our rodent data, then yeah. we haven't seen anything, but you know, you have to, you're going to have to come to terms with some of that human data about whether, though, 
those associations really were more a surrogate for exposure because the diethyl is so prevalent in the in humans yeah. or whether it really is causative. Yeah, yeah. And our plan, I think, is to rely heavily on the NRC report. Um, and is there any, <laughs> any? I mean, it was tailor made for this this exercise. But are there any uh, things that uh, we ought to? Any reason not to, to not do that? Not not that there's any conflict. That's an excellent panel. I don't. Know. Okay. That panel was okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think <laughs> I failed charm school. Uh, I think I think that the, the evidence that exists is cons generated since that meeting is consistent with the report, and I, I don't think that there's evidence studies to the contrary. Uh, but it. There's not a lot of publications or, or studies. Um. Yeah. Um. And I think uh, one, one thing that we did want to ask, are, are there any critical studies, bioassays? one or two that could be done in a short period of time that would make a, a significant impact on what we're doing? Well, there's some some of the phthalates that if you were going to consider all the active ones, there some of the ones that we found to be active, there's very little data on. So the diheptal phthalate, I think there's, what, one study yep. of his? Hexel's not and hexyl, there's not many. The dipental phthalate, uh, there's, there's, you know, a lot of these, there are no developmental multi-generational studies. Okay, yeah. And so there, there's a large database on phthalate reproductive toxicity, and I just guess 95% of it is to do with two or three phthalates. So there are a lot that we don't know much about. I know that, I think EPA was, on, may not, when it gets to the program office, may not consider phthalates that are very, very minor use or no obvious apparent use at all. So I think there, there was some question about if anybody even uses dipental. Yeah, yeah. So it's an exciting chemical from our perspective because of its potency to validate yeah. the question, but it might not be too relevant for cumulative risks. Looking at the the database, um, you know all the different endpoints. It, it's it's not always clear to me. Do do we have data on common endpoints for the say the the handful six or eight chemicals that are probably the most important? Um, if we have to say um, you know, you have effects on uh, variations, malformations on one chemical. You have testosterone production data on another. Um, are, are we going to have problems combining different endpoints for some of the different phthalates? Or are we going to be faced with that? Yeah. For the postnatal studies, I mean, what I looked at, I you, you can compare across the studies, and there's some endpoints that you can't really compare like hypospadias because it's not reported in a lot of the papers. And there's some of the things that we've begun to measure that people didn't measure uh, in in many of those studies. So so that anogenital distance or gubernacular changes won't be there. But we did find in most of the postnatal studies that we looked at that there were there were also five or six common endpoints that I that had graphed. So you almost all of them had uh, Testicular and epididymal alterations, and sometimes and histopath alterations. So, you, and they have most of them have 
organ weights and things like that. So it's likely a ro sufficiently robust database to... There are some com endpoints common to all the papers, even the older ones. Yeah. I think you, you also have to be careful about, you might have confidence in ascribing that an effect may have occurred, yeah. but I don't think you'd necessarily have as much confidence in when an effect didn't occur, or at what dose level. Okay, okay, yeah. And, well, the other part of that is the dose response. Exactly, yeah. And do we have adequate dose responses for a lot of these? Um, I guess, well, let's see. Um, we, we heard a lot about uh, other anti-androgens. Um, and I guess some of, one of them, uh, there was a question whether people are commonly exposed to it. But it, if we were to, not that we're necessarily going to do it, but if the CHAP were going to consider other anti-androgens, what should we consider uh, on the basis of what people are likely to be exposed to. Do you, do you know that? Well, I think for the U.S. population, you'd probably exclude prosimidon because it's only imported in expensive French wine. So as long as the pregnant women aren't consuming large, or children are not consuming large quantities of that. Um, so there's, uh, and the, there's the other, some of the others are food use pesticides, you'd have to look at the exposure information there. So there may be selected populations that have higher exposures, but uh, I wouldn't, based on that information, you might end up excluding all of them. So we'd, we'd have to get exposure data. But you do have from the risk assessments, the RFDs, yeah. and, they, and they also estimate margin of exposures. Okay. And a lot of those, they, like for Vinclosin, I'm more familiar with, they estimate the top 95% you know, of exposure you could. Oh, as, as Andreas had talked about, it sort of simulate the worst case exposure situation for some of these and see if it would contribute anything yeah. at all. Okay. I remember some of the weak anti-androgens are like you know, para para DDE, which probably we've all got in our fat yeah. as well. So some of them are more likely to be a co-exposure than others. Yeah, which actually of all the things that we have in our bodies and in our fat, um, I don't know how many chemicals. I mean, there must be others or some that have that are potentially uh, interact with the phthalates or can contribute to the, the effects, the cumulative effects. I think that's all I have. Any other comments? Chris? Some of that discussion, and maybe I miss or sim oversimplify what you all were talking about, but um, so we were thinking about reproductive effects, uh, so pregnant mom effect or exposures to pregnant moms and fetuses. But what about toddlers? Are we worried about exposure to toddlers? Well, some of the highest exposures recorded are actually to NICU infants. But I'm talking about effects, not exposure. Well, I think in, I don't think that uh, in the NICU kids, you have kids that have health problems, and I don't know that they're you could tell the monitored for very long, and you wouldn't have an inadequate control population. I think for neonatal exposures only in rodents, that might be the appropriate exposure period for infant toys. I think, I think there are two studies, two, three studies published where there's only that exposure. And they said one of them is Lori Dostal and Bern Schwetz, and the other was uh, Baxter chemical study with oral and injectin studies and they was single dose, single dose or two high dose and the DEHP was positive with oral sub Q exposure in those with permanent testicular effects, but it was, you know, Injected or oral six three I think it was three and six hundred milligrams per kilogram. So there's really a paucity of data there. Uh, I think that 
Most of our studies have included in utero exposure, in utero and lactational exposure, looking at fetal development and its interference with androgen signaling and other pathways. And I guess the question you have to ex sort of extrapolate is the androgen signaling or those pathways important in the human infant? You know, and there is that neonatal infant testosterone surge in humans that, that Ruskin, you can all discuss, and I think it's, it's believed to be important in some processes, but its role in humans is less certain. Sex differentiation in you. I think so. There's there, not there, a lot of information yeah. there either. There have been some effects on in, on puberty, right, as well, which would be later. Right. Yeah. Uh, concerning uh, other chemicals to take into account, sort of via uh, background exposures, according to our charge, um, I thought uh, all your data, which you showed today about combinations of TCDD and DBP, were, shall we say, a little provocative. Um, the how can I put it? I think in my mind there are now indi these data indicate to me that. Uh, background exposure to dioxins might modulate, let's put it this way, in some serious way, the effects of, of phthalate exposure. But um, my impression also is that it's probably too early to come to, um, to move this into some sort of quantitative assessment. Could you comment on that? Or? Well, I would agree it's too early to put it into a quantitative assessment to say if the cumulative effects were response or dose additive and it, and it I mean we're talking about a limited published data set where it I wouldn't even go out on a limb and definitely say that there was uh, a cumulative effect that appeared that way from the pilot study and we're repeating it so it's in to me an intriguing hypothesis but I wouldn't make a regulatory decision on it now, if if we even though it's my own wonderful data, <laughs> well, it shows shows how modest you are and how <laughs> responsible. <laughs> but let let's uh, put this mixture effect aside. I'm also rather interested in uh, the connection between uh, dioxin and and these endpoints you looked at, TCDD in particular. Is can we, just looking at TCD as a single chemical for a moment, uh, on the basis of some data that are published, maybe, or by you, uh, come, to, come to a quantitation of the effects? Oh, well, there's in, from the rat studies, there's a lot of dose-response data from right. exposures okay. to dioxin. Uh, and... Uh, I think probably the, the lowest dose exposures are from a mm. multi-gen study done with Murray and were you on that one too, Dr. Schwetz? Yeah. <laughs> Where they were giving, you know, nanogram quantities per day and uh, have clear adverse effects in the animal. So the things that all of us have done since then are uh, one exposure in pregnancy to microgram quantities, and you see rather reproducible reproductive effects in the offspring, the males and in the females. And those can be quantified. Based on what you understand or surmise about the mechanisms of action at, in operation there with respect to these effects, what about all the other dioxins and uh, polychlorinated dibenzofurans? Can they? Is this perhaps an uh, AH receptor-mediated contribution, and should the others be taken into account as well along those lines? Or what's your comment? Oh, I think that's the general an hypothesis. But you know, EPA has been uh, had a dioxin risk assessment ongoing for hmm. twenty years, a long time, and it's. Right just in draft form now, so I don't think the agency has a consensus that's accepted and peer-reviewed yet on uh, the adverse effects. From the rat literature, it's, it's clear. And, and you get similar effects with the 
in the rat from some of the dioxin-like PCBs as you get with the dioxin. Okay, thank you. Let's take a break and we'll reconvene at uh, 3. Hello? Hello?
Dial cannot be completed as dialed. Please check. Welcome to the Conference Calling Center. At any time during this message, please enter your passcode followed by the pound sign.
the passcode you are attempting to enter is invalid. Please check your passcode and try again. The passcode you are attempting to enter is invalid. Please check your passcode and try again.
Welcome to the Conference Calling Center. At any time during this message, please enter your passcode followed by the pound sign. Your passcode has been confirmed. If you need technical assistance during your call, press star zero. After the tone, please state your name followed by the pound sign. CPSC Headquarters. There are three parties in conference, including you. Hello, Abby? Are you there? Stephen? Hello. 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 So, is, is that Stephen and Abby? Uh, this is Laura Governelli in um, FDA. Um, okay, could you say your name again, Laura? Laura Governelli. Okay, uh, anyone else? Abby should be calling in. Uh, maybe I'll try emailing her. Okay, is that Steven? Yes, yeah, this is Steven, sorry. <laughs> Good, how are you? Good. Let me see if Abby can call in. Well, let me start. Uh, this afternoon, we have uh, some of our federal partners uh, in to speak with us um, from EPA and FDA. And I have asked them to tell us uh, about any phthalates activities that are ongoing at their agencies or specifically in their program offices and uh, to uh, tell us if they have in, uh, any information or knowledge they have that might be helpful to the CHAP because as we're acutely aware, uh, not all of our exposure comes from consumer products. Uh, much of it comes from other sources, the environment, from uh, Foods, drugs, cosmetics, and medical devices, to name a few. Yeah, that might be helpful to the chat um, because as so we ha we do aware, have uh, not all of uh, well with us here today Peter Gimlin from EPA uh, Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics, Jamie Strong from uh, the National Center for Environmental Assessment. Ron Brown from the center uh, from FDA, the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Uh, on the line 
We have uh, Stephen Chang and Laura Gubernelli from the FDA Office of Drugs. And is has Abby joined yet? Okay. Well, we have. Uh, we're expecting Abby. Abby Jacobs uh, also to, to call in. So oh, I'm in. Okay. Um, welcome, Abby. So, uh, Peter, would you like to to start and tell us a little bit about what's going on at OPPT? Uh, whichever you like. Uh, just press the button. Um, I don't have a slideshow, so I'll just talk here. What I'm really mostly going to talk about is. Uh, a regulatory action plan we've developed at EPA. I'll just pass some copies out to the group here if they're not familiar with it already. I'm Peter Gimlin. I'm an OPPT. That's uh, really it's our regulatory control office dealing with toxic issues. Um, I think Jamie's going to talk about some of the research in a few minutes. Um, and I was the <clears throat> work chair to help develop that plan, so that's why I've been invited here. Um, this document and this effort stems out of uh, uh, an effort that started last summer with a new administration to try to revitalize our approach to Tosca. This toxic statute, Toxic Substance Control Act, was from 1976. And some parts have worked well, but with the control of existing chemicals already in the market, not a lot's happened. Um, some things have been regulated, but in, other, in a lot of cases it's been very slow and we haven't done much to control things. And so there is, um, well, there's various legislation on the Hill right now about reforms to TOSCA, which there's a lot of interest in. But uh, in the meantime, we've got the existing TOSCA. And one of the efforts is to try to revitalize, um, try to put some more effort into what we're doing and seeing if we can make the existing law work as best it can. Um, out of that effort, we released in December several so-called action plans, which are really roadmaps or just in public announcements and uh, laying out uh, what we intend to do to control some existing chemicals and our reasons for doing it. Um, one of these is the phthalates action plan I just handed out. Um, this plan, we, for, for purposes of this plan, we've identified eight phthalates that we're going to take action on, at least that we've identified in this plan. It's possible as we get into more further along in, in regulation or research, we find that some of them don't warrant um, full-scale, you know, regu additional regulatory controls. We may find that some we've left out and need to be brought in. Um, but we started out with this group. Um, it's the six that are specifically mentioned in the SIPSIA legislation. Um, and two additional ones, uh, DIBP and DNPP, that are being um, studied by, uh, by Jamie's group. They came out of the National Academy of Science report. Um, and we've got some research underway on those, so we included those as well. Um, <clears throat> By way of background, one of the and one of the, the questions you posed was the the relationship of the EPA control to the FDA, um, and that. This issue really goes back to the, the language in the Tosca statute itself. Um, so it, it's not a not a, a regulatory matter so much as a statutory issue. Uh, when Tosca was passed by Congress, um, the language in the the definitions of Section Three of Tosca they define the term chemical substance to mean broadly any organic or inorganic substance, combination, elements, and radicals. But then they go on to say such term does not include, and they list various things, um, and one of those is any food, food additive, drug, cosmetic, or device, such as terms, as such terms are defined in Section 201 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, 
been manufactured, processed, or distributed in commerce for use as a food, food additive, drug, cosmetic, or device. So <clears throat> in giving us our authority under TOSCA to regulate toxic substances, they specifically exempted any of those devices or products that are already being regulated by FDA. Um, so pretty much there's, there's a very clear bright line from with our basic statutory authority that whatever FDA is regulating under their authority, we don't regulate under TOSCA. Um, so we, we need to coordinate what we're doing, um, but there won't be overlap. It's a little different situation than we have with the uh, consumer product consumer products where theoretically both, you know, if you have consumer product with phthalates, in theory, we could also, provide it's not an FDA yet, and we could also regulate it. Um, now, in many cases, it wouldn't make sense, but, you know, we can we can work on who would be best suited to maybe go after certain items. But with FDA, if it's if it falls into their categorization, then it's it's up to them, and we're not going to be able to, to do anything about it under TOSCA. Um, now, that briefly, the steps in the plan we've laid out, we've listed some intended actions, and these are mostly actions we can take with our authority under TOSCA. Um, one is to put them on a, a list of chemicals of concern. This is a, uh, an existing authority that we've actually never used at the EPA, so this is a bit of an experiment to, to, to try to make use of this and see what advantage it is. It produces. It doesn't. Um, it's basically essentially a list of chemicals. It's a public list to let the public know we have concerns about these chemicals. And it was. Um, it they're not. It 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 doesn't have too many immediate effects in the regulations about you know, about controls or restrictions or the like. It's it's really just um, a primarily a list. Um, we do, we currently right now on track to publish a proposed rule in September, and at that point I'll be open for public comment. Um, we don't have a fixed date for a final rule sometime next year, um, maybe perhaps by the summer, depending on the extent of public comments we get. Um, the other action, second action we're taking, um, and this is actually under a different statute, is to uh, start rulemaking to put all these eight phthalates, phthalates on the TRI list for, for public reporting. Um, right now, only two of them are on the list, um, uh, DBP and DEHP. And if we get these others on the list, we'll get some more reporting data in a few years from the public about, um, you know, uses and releases, well, releases, but uh, it'll give us some more information and hopefully we can get a better idea of exposures. Um, from that data. Um, we've started the rulemaking process. Um, there's no fixed date for the proposal. I imagine sometime next year we might have a proposal out. We have to go through rulemaking on that as well. So it'll take a little time to get a final rule out and then uh, there's the reporting cycle and to get the data back in. So it'll be a few years before we get any new data from that effort. Um, We also begun a, on one of the chemicals, <coughs> the DNPP, in looking at the data, there's an inventory update reporting requirement under TOSCA. Um, it has certain thresholds of, um, I think in these cases it's 25,000 pounds of production it has to be reported periodically to EPA. We didn't get any reports on this chemical in the last couple of cycles. Um, so we're going to try to impose a restriction on it called a SNR or significant new use rule. Uh, essentially the, back, the idea is under TOSCA if you come up with a new chemical that's not in the marketplace you have to come into EPA to get a, approval. There's a screening process, a 90-day review. Um, if we issue this significant new use rule on this chemical then that requirement will be imposed on DNPP. And if anybody were to reintroduce it into the marketplace, they would have to come in through this review screening by EPA. Um, so that'll give us a little advance notice if it's going to be reintroduced in the market and a chance to consider if there are 
any restrictions or requirements or additional information we might want to see from that. Uh, we're going to come out in a schedule to propose something early next year. Uh, at this point, we're not certain if there could be smaller manufacturers, smaller importers or uses. We're doing a little background investigation on that right now, and if we don't hear any, if we don't get anything solid on that, the proposal would have an opportunity for public comment, and then that would be people's chance to basically raise their hand if they're actually using it. Um, if that's the case, then we'll have to assess how much is being used and if we can proceed with some modified version of this or not. Um, we've also begun a uh, an assessment under our Design for the Environment program to basically look at phthalates, uh, how they're being used, um, if and primarily um, what they're being used for, what kind of substitutes are available, are there better, safer substitutes, um, talk to the industry, see if they uh, have any interest in using these. If, um, basically, it's a voluntary program, uh, looking into it, seeing if there are safer, greener ways to handle chemicals, um, try to enlist the cooperation of industry in working on the project. Um, that project, the scope of that's being set out this summer, exactly the details of that. It will be completed sometime in 2012. Um, and um, we'll be interested particularly in this to see, well, obviously, what can, what can be worked out with industry before we get to any kind of rulemaking. Um, and also uh, to see what, uh, what's developed in substitutes. I think it's one of the issues we're dealing with in the terms of regulating this uh, safe and commercially available substitutes, what's out there. And finally, the last part of the plan is to consider rulemaking under Section 6 of TOSCA. This is the part of TOSCA that gives us our broadest authority to regulate chemicals. Uh, anything uh, up into including a full-blown ban of the chemical, but there can be lots of, you know, partial bans or restrictions, marking requirements, um, pretty much you name it. There's, there's you know, any anything up into including a full ban of chemicals possible, uh, depending on various findings we have to make in the statute about the, uh, the risk involved. We have to make basically what's called a no and reasonable risk finding. And it has to be, pretty much our controls have to be matched to what we find in terms of the relative risk of the chemical and what the controls would accomplish. We've got that down at the moment basically as something targeted for initiating in 2012. Um, when we got into looking at phthalates last summer, uh, what we quickly realized is that what you're dealing with here is the, the, the cumulative risks are really going to drive a lot of this and that a lot of work was being done on it right now. Not only your panel and your panel's report would inform this, but the research uh, we're doing right now at EPA for IRIS and that it was basically premature to try to attempt to to move forward with any regulations looking at uh, phthalates on a case-by-case -case basis or using the existing individual assessments and maybe just trying to take an additive approach that, you know, whatever we, whatever case we develop for rulemaking would basically be surpassed you know, by the information that comes out of your project and the IRIS project. There's also an endocrine disruptor review going on at EPS well. So the in this case, it was really necessary to to wait until we get this information and we can use it to support the rulemaking. Um, I think you had asked the question too about um, just generally and and data gaps um, and issues. Um, Again, we haven't got into this hard building a rulemaking record issue yet, so we, can, we can't lay out specifics. I couldn't lay out specifics that so we need this piece and that piece. But in general, um, we're missing some uh, ecotoxicity data, and particularly on DNPP and DNOP, there's uh, some missing data. I guess it's a general. In some chemicals, we've got a pretty good case, like in, in DHP seems to be pretty well studied. Other ones, it's uh, somewhat spotty a record. Um, 
The information on generally on release and work worker exposure could be a little better. I think we've got um, certain data, but um, we would like more certainly for doing uh, a rule. Um, more information on human exposure sources, particularly for DINP, DIDP, and, and DNOP. Um, the exposure data we have varies. Again, we've got pretty good data for DEHP, um, but for those three I listed and some of the others, we could use more. Um, also, the issue of trying to, we don't have a good sense right now where, we're looking at the data, where particularly you know sources come from. We know there's human exposure. We know it's out in the environment and some of the sources, but trying to piece together the picture of you know these particular uses are attributable to this component of the human exposure. It's it's they went the details of that um, can't I haven't been able to piece that together yet. Um, Particularly um, the adult data we would like to look at more. I know you're focused on the children's data, and actually a lot of the data right now seems to be focused on the children's exposure issue. Um, but some of the adult data is getting a bit dated. Um, some of it's 10 years or, or more older, and a lot of the data comes from Europe and Canada, and we didn't find much data on U.S. exposures in particular. Um, one of the bigger issues I think we'll need to try to get a better handle on is the, the mechanism of the migration of the phthalates from the PVC plastic. Um, a great deal of it's being used in PVC, and um, this is potentially uh, a large reservoir of phthalates in the environment and a means for spreading phthalates throughout the environment globally. Um, but a better handle on how fast do these phthalates migrate out of PCBs and under what circumstances to get back, to get free back into the environment. Um, and then finally I mentioned earlier the whole issue of substitutes. Um, there seems to be quite a number of potential substitutes out there. Some pretty well developed. I heard you mentioning Dinch earlier today that, you know, that's been developed and is actually out on the market. Um, a few others on the market, but the whole issue of, uh, you know, how many are these suitable for all the various applications of phthalates are used for, you know, which ones would be suitable for which application, um, the cost as a substitute, are they economically viable, and uh, also the risk. We want to make, you know, we're looking to move people to uh, safer substitutes and make sure that we're not just pushing pushing the market from one set of risks to another set of risks. That's it. Does the uh, panel have any questions for Peter? I'm, I'm not all that familiar with the task of um, requirements, but um, we're comparing sort of the, the limits based on, you know, here's the FDA and here's the EPA sort of um, purview. Um, so my question is, uh, thinking about the FDA has requirements of, you know, uh, certain products being listed on food items and you know, what's in the ingredients. That's not the case for products, for air products and things like that. Is that something that the EPA could actually uh, try to impose that here are these phthalates, we don't know where they are, you know, what products, could that, could it, could it, does it have the ability to actually require those things be listed? Um, yeah, it does. Under the, under the Section 6 of TSCA, we could require um, uh, labeling. That's one of the provisions specifically mentioned. So that could be an outcome of, of a rulemaking instead of, you know, a ban or some of the controls, simply a labeling requirement that if your product has phthalates, it would list it. could be done. Uh, how long would it take for you to arrive at such a decision? Uh, unfortunately, it takes a while. The um, plan is to start rulemaking in 2012. Um, there's a process of 
uh, propose, we have to propose a rule, take public comment, then issue a final rule. So uh, in practice, it tends to drag out, and it can take several years to get a final rule out. So starting in 2012 and several years from then. So it's a slow process. Um, <clears throat> for the different uh, actions, for example, the chemicals of concern list, the TRI list, um, are they hazard-based? What kind of information do you need to support those regulations? Um, they have different standards, and they're less than the Section 6. The Section 6, which is the most restrictive, um, is the most burdensome when we have to make a finding uh, that the chemical uh, may present an unreasonable or will present an unreasonable risk. So we have to look at the exposure and toxicity and make an assessment. Um, the chemical concern list is um, based on a lesser standard of it may present an unreasonable risk. So we really just have to uh, basically make a make a basic finding that there there's some exposure and there's some toxicity. We don't have to, to prove the level, um, but you know there's we have to basically lay the groundwork that there may be an unreasonable risk here. So that's a much lower burden of proof. Um, the Significant new use rule, um, there are certain criteria laid out in the statute. Um, most of them deal really pertain to exposure. So it's mostly making exposure finding for a SNR. Um, the TRI listing, um, they have their own standard. And I regret to say I can't tell you what that is offhand because it's a different statute. Um, I believe it's mostly uh, an exposure-based finding for a TRI listing. So, but it's certainly a lesser standard. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is, are there any opportunities where we're going to overlap, where are the CHAPS activities and, and your activities uh, may be the same? And I'm thinking, actually, the DFE activity looks like the the most significant overlap. Um, is is there anything else? Uh, are you going to be uh, doing an exposure assessment or not until you know uh, before 2012 or or looking at exposure data? Anything like that? There there will be some background reporting reports uh, study to support the TRI listing. Um, believe those will be ready. There'll be a, basically a report on each one of the six chemicals. Those will be ready, or should be ready uh, next spring. I'm not sure if that's publicly available at that point. That'd be made publicly available with a proposed rule. Um, I'm not sure that's going to go into enough detail to, to be of much it's probably covered ground that you've already covered in your your preliminary technical reports we could certainly try to share them with you as soon as we can get them and make them available hopefully before their public release we can get some clearance to send them to you but that's still looking at early next year uh, i'm not sure that will have that much new in it for you it's basically uh usually they just get contracted out and it's probably background probably mostly a literature review I would imagine. Um, I'm not sure how much new assessment would be in those. Um, for the significant new use, new use rule on DNPP, we'll be doing an economic analysis to support that, which would basically be looking at um, uses, how much, how much we think is being used and what the uses would be. At this point, we're hopefully it's come back with nothing, but um, if there is anything, then it'll, it'll basically assess that. Um, 
that also would be part of the public record. I'm not sure when we would, when that would be available later this year. I can see if there's something we can get to you in advance or not. Uh, I'm not sure again how much use that would be. Uh, but yeah, I agree the DF, the design for the environment assessment may be the most uh, useful thing we can cooperate on at the moment. Um, it's again, it's getting scoped out this summer. I'm not sure at one point we'll have useful information to share. We can. Okay. So um, keep yeah, I think that if if we knew it, well, if you couldn't find anyone making uh, dye pental, then I think that would be one less thing that we have to worry about. Okay. Well, I'll keep you informed of that. A question that I think is a follow-up to Mike's. Your overview statement of the action plan says that recent scientific attention is focusing on evaluating the cumulative effects of mixtures of phthalates in an exposed organism. In view of the timing of this plan, is that cumulative risk assessment likely to be something that's done before all of the rest of the announcement of your, of your planned activities? Or is this saying that this would eventually become part of what happens after an advance notice of proposed rulemaking? It's at Not the end much. of the second paragraph of the overview. Uh, let's see. Last sentence. That's just a broad statement about um, scientific attention, not specific, specifically laying out something we're doing to support the action plan. It's just talking about the fact that the NSA study had come out looking at that, what's going on generally. Um, Congress had tasks this group to look at it, our, um, our ORDs looking at the issue as well. It's, it, it's just a general statement. Well, we've discussed that also. So what I'm wondering is whether you have already decided which phthalates would be the ones and which endpoints and which age groups you'd be modeling? No. 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 Okay. We haven't got there. I, I think Jamie may talk about that. <laughs> any any more questions? Thank you, Peter. No, uh, thank you. Uh, next is uh, Jamie Strong from NCIA, uh National Center for Environmental Assessment. Okay, um, thank you very much. I uh, am glad to be here to tell you a little bit about what's going on at the Integrated Risk Information System Program within the National Center for Environmental Assessment um, at ORD at EPA. So just, uh, Mike asked me to give a little bit of background. Um, EPA's IRIS program is a human health assessment program that evaluates qualitative and quantitative health risk information um, to for different chemicals in the environment and currently we have information on over 540 substances on our database. We address chronic exposures typically. Um, the assessments include many high-profile first applications of risk assessment guidelines and science policy. 
We do non-cancer and cancer hazard characterization. Um, we do the hazard identification and dose re response part of the risk assessment paradigm. We include a mode of action analysis for both non-cancer and cancer effects where the data are available. And we derive reference doses and oral slope factors for effects resulting from oral exposure and reference concentrations and inhala inhalation unit risks um, for effect from inhalation exposure. On May 21st, 2009, the administrator of EPA released a new IRIS process, and this has led to increased improvements in transparency, consistency, and public participation in the process. And you can find the process at our website um, at epa.gov backslash IRIS. So currently on the IRIS database, we have several individual assessments for th several individual phthalates, including uh, DBP, uh, dibutyl phthalate, di ethyl hexyl phthalate, DEHP, butyl benzyl phthalate, BBP, diethyl phthalate, DEP, and dimethyl phthalate, DMP. Now, these assessments were done throughout the 80s, so, um, and are based on effects, uh, the RFDs are developed based on effects such as mortality, liver weight, um, and de decreased growth rates and alterations in growth. Only RFDs were developed for these because of the lack of inhalation data at the time the assessments were done. And then these are the cancer assessments for those uh, five phthalates that I mentioned. Uh, the only one that has a quantitative cancer assessment is diethyl hexyl phthalate. And again, these were done in the 80s. So I just wanted to let you know what was currently available on the IRIS database. IRIS uh, assesses chemicals on an individual basis and, and has that's been the, the way that we have done things in the past. But, uh, so the concept of cumulative risk for hazard and dose response represents a paradigm shift for our program. But the science of risk assessment is increasingly complex and more data are available that lead to questions on how to address issues of multiple exposures, multiple risks, and susceptibility in populations. As part of this, uh, the, the ever-growing database, um, we, we took on, the, uh, asked the NAS to go ahead and look at cumulative risk, particularly for the phthalates based on the following rationale. The phthalate esters, as I'm sure Earl and Paul Foster told you this morning, are a group of chemicals that are used in the manufacture of various products. They're in personal care products, pharmaceuticals, detergents, medical tubing, et cetera. And then humans are exposed to various phthalates and their metabolites in the environment, including through direct contact with these various products. Multiple phthalates have been detected in saliva, urine, amniotic fluid, and breast milk in humans. And the human epi studies have demonstrated a possible association between exposure to some phthalates and their metabolites and indicators of potential effects on the male reproductive system. And, and these studies uh, mirror those effects that are seen in animal studies also. So as I said, in 2008, we uh, elicited expert uh, external expert consultation from the National Academies. Many of you served on that panel or spoke to that panel. Um, in the evaluations of issues and approaches related to conducting a cumulative risk assessment for the phthalates. So this was our charge to the committee. Uh, we asked them to look, to identify and prioritize data gaps and research needs related to the phthalates and to doing a cumulative risk assessment for the phthalates. We also asked them to identify issues related to cumulative hazard and dose response assessment for the phthalates and to provide recommendations on the relevant phthalates for consideration in a cumulative assessment. And then finally, discussion of the data that would be required to perform a cumulative assessment for this class of chemicals. And in December of 2008, the National Academies released their report, uh, Phthalates and Cumulative Risks, the Tasks Ahead. And this is just a very brief summary of their conclusions, but um, the main one was to include phthalates and other chemicals, for example, agents that cause androgen insufficiency or block the androgen receptor signaling pathway in a cumulative risk assessment, and to base this cumulative risk assessment on common adverse outcome, not to focus exclusively on, on similar modes of action. And that although a variety of mechanisms are clearly involved, Dose addition did provide uh, adequately predictive methods when the committee evaluated the available data for the phthalates. Um, the bottom line was that a focus solely on the phthalates to the exclusion of other antiandrogens would be artificial and could seriously underestimate risk. 
Now, the, ref the report's implications are far-reaching and potentially impact the entire agency. Um, our plan and that we've put into action is to evaluate the underlying science behind the recommendations and to consider the implications for the actual IRS assessment. We are evaluating the options for performing a cumulative risk assessment for the phthalates presented in the report, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the next couple slides. Um, particularly, we're planning a workshop for this fall on the specific recommendations related to the methods for conducting cumulative risk assessment. Um, the recommendations from the panel, and as I said, that, that's scheduled for October and November timeframe this fall. So we have initiated an IRIS human health assessment for selected phthalates, which includes the following six phthalates. Prior to the NAS convening to, to evaluate cumulative risk assessment, we, we currently, we had on the agenda, on the IRIS agenda, dibutyl phthalate, diethyl hexyl phthalate, and butyl benzyl phthalate. And following the release of the report and consider, consideration of the recommendations, we've gone ahead and added diisononal phthalate, dipental, and diisobutyl phthalate to this assessment. The assessment will include non-cancer and cancer qualitative and quantitative health effects information and where the data are available for each of the phthalates. The assessment will also include a cumulative hazard and dose response assessment for these six phthalates. The cumulative assessment that IRIS has undertaken may serve as a framework for extension to other phthalates and to compounds that affect similar adverse outcomes in the future. An external peer review of this uh, assessment is anticipated to begin in 2011, and you can follow the schedule at the IRIS website on our IRIS track system. Some general issues related to cumulative risk assessment for the phthalates that, that we're currently dealing with and, and hopefully will address um, at our workshop are toxicokinetic issues, exposure issues, identification and selection of the data to serve as the basis for the cumulative risk assessment, for example, recognizing that the induction of any of the phthalate syndrome effects is representative versus focusing on the effects common to the six um, or the most sensitive outcome. We're going to ask at the workshop, um, are there other non-reproductive, non-cancer endpoints, and what should we do about cancer endpoints? As I said, the methods um, for conducting a cumulative risk assessment and then the inclusion and exclusion of other antiandrogenic chemicals and what that means. The primary goal of the workshop is to discuss and evaluate the NAS's recommendations, um, specifically methods for performing a cumulative risk assessment. And the purpose is to facilitate discussion of which options for conducting the cumulative risk assessment should be included in the assessment and the strengths and limitations of each of these options. And CIA recognizes the importance of the recommendations related to the inclusion of other antiandrogens in addition to phthalates and the possibility that exclusion could lead to an underestimation of risk. So as I, I mentioned before, we hope that this will serve as a framework um, that can be extended to other compounds and possibly other phthalates as data bec becomes available that indicates that they affect common adverse outcomes. Potential objectives um, is the identification of which methods should be used. NAS recommended uh, two approaches uh, for aggregation of cumulative risk. One was a hazard index and one was a point of departure index that Dr. Kortenkamp has probably presented or discussed with you. We want to look at any other methods that could possibly be beneficial for the assessment. We also want to talk about data sets, um, the presentation of cumulative risk based on mixtures data, or should we be looking at the human versus the animal mixtures data, um, presentation of cumulative risk based on individual phthalates data, again, human versus animal, and are there other data sets that we should be considering. And finally, identification of sensitive effects to serve as the basis for this determination um, of the points of departure. As I mentioned in the previous slide, looking at the phthalate syndrome as a whole versus the most sensitive or an individual effect that is common among them. And then are there other endpoints that we should be looking at outside of the male reproductive tract system? Going on at IRIS, um, I don't know if any questions. Are there any questions from the panel? Well, just an, an observation that uh, issues that you've highlighted on your slide, <laughs> the exact issues that we've highlighted as issues that we need to address. Um, have you at this point identified those individuals who are going to participate in the workshop? We've just initiated a, a contract with a contractor, and so we're, we're currently um, looking at a work plan, and we're going to work with the contractor to, to develop a list of experts 
a recommended list of experts to include in the discussion. And you plan on starting your deliberations this fall? Yes. That's something we obviously need, since we're doing things in parallel, need yeah. to be involved with. And I've talked yeah. to Mike, and we've had coordination and communication, and I definitely hope that some of you or some uh, can either attend or, or participate as, as part of the panel. Yeah, I'm wondering if maybe we could schedule our meeting to back up to that or something. I know that would be a long time commitment, but um, do, do you have or will you have a, uh, a rationale for why you chose the six phthalates that you did? Part of it is the, the recommendations of the NAS panel. Um, and we are looking at common adverse outcome. And as Earl and Paul indicated, it, it seems that the male reproductive tract is the primary target of toxicity. But as Earl and Paul also mentioned before, and, and as we're starting to realize as we get farther into the assessment, there's new data emerging on other phthalates that may cause similar adverse outcomes. So do we just continue to add phthalates to the assessment, or can this serve as a framework? That's one of the issues that we hope to discuss at, at the workshop also. This is a first step, though. Question about <coughs> selecting a non-phthalate antiandrogen. Okay. <clears throat> first of all, how many would be enough to make this kind of a cumulative evaluation better? Is one enough? Is two? Is three? And because this is an EPA activity, would it have to be a pesticide? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the list that was presented as part of the recommendations from the NES is, is quite a long list and includes PBDEs, dioxins, PCBs, some pesticides. Um, we have talked to OPP and they're aware of what we're doing in our assessment and we, we continue to keep in communication with the different program offices. but. I don't have an answer for that right now. I mean, at this point, what we're doing is the six phthalates and a cumulative assessment for those six. And there's also a question of how, how widespread would the exposure have to be to that particular material to really be in addition to the cumulative risk assessment? Because if it's a pesticide to which a very small number of applicators are, or users <coughs> are exposed, would that be relevant? And As opposed to a PCB or a dioxin where everybody might be exposed. We're trying to scope out the extent of the exposure information that we're going to include. Obviously, we're going to have to with doing the cumulative risk assessment for these six. But with regards to the pesticides, it's interesting that you say that because for a lot of pesticides, phthalates are inert ingredients. So you may not even have a measure of exposure. So I'm, are, are we overlooking, uh, so phthalates like DET are common components of pesticides? Is that what? I would have to refer to somebody in OPP, but after yeah. my discussions with them last time, it was, I mean, it was evident that they are inert ingredients in pesticides. So I'm wondering. I don't know which phthalate. If we need to, if I was remiss in not inviting OPP to the meeting or maybe we can have them at a future meeting. Does the panel have any other? Um, thank you, Jamie. Thanks. Look forward to the fall meeting. And before I introduce the next speaker, I neglected to introduce Donald Havery from e uh, FDA, the Office of Cosmetics and Colors. Uh, our next speaker from FDA Center for Devices and Radiological Health is Ron Brown. Oh, good afternoon. So I'm going to discuss our experience with phthalates in medical devices. DHP is the primary plasticizer in PVC medical devices. Um, we did have some knowledge that DEP and maybe DBP were used as solvents and in inks on IV bags, but that's really a minority of the exposure. Really the main actor is, is DEHP. So in 2001, we conducted a safety assessment of DEHP released from medical device materials. And that was, report was put on the website, and that's readily available to the CHAP. And 
In fact, Dr. Schwartz, you may remember when you were the acting principal deputy where you had included a summary of that study on the uh, update of FDA activities and the JAMA uh, notification that you had. So that's been out there for a while. But we did recognize that there's some new studies coming down the pike, and I'm sure you've heard about some of those today and, and yesterday. So we are uh, updating that risk assessment under the auspices of the International Organization for Standardization. But it was the earlier safety assessment that served as the scientific basis for a public health notification that we issued that provided healthcare providers with uh, guidelines on what types of phthalate containing devices to use in what patient populations. So just briefly, some of the recommendations were don't alter a medical procedure just because you're worried about exposing the patient to phthalates that gets involved in the risk and benefit decisions. So really the main decision was a medical one, not necessarily worried about ex exposure to phthalates. But if there were alternatives available for certain procedures that you should consider them for high risk groups like male neonates. One of the challenges though is that the labeling is, is such that healthcare providers now have a difficult time determining which PVC devices are plasticized and not. And, and that's something that we're working on possibly with, with labeling guidance. So in that safety assessment, there were really three parts. One was an exposure assessment specific to devices. The other was a, an effort to derive a tolerable intake for DEHP. So conceptually, the tolerable intake is similar to the EPA's RFD or maybe an acceptable daily intake. One of the differences, though, is that we can derive a tolerable intake for different routes of exposure and even different durations of exposure. And the process to derive those tolerable intakes is really based on an international consensus standard that was developed through ISO, so we can get international buy-in on the methodology. Um, we based the parenteral TI, actually the intravenous TI, on the data in the Kamak et al. Uh, 2002 study. So that was a study in which they administered DEHP solubilized in intralipid intravenously to three to five day old rat pups. So technically it was not a trivial undertaking. Uh, they exposed the animals continuously for 21 days and sacrificed them. They had one group that they did the necropsy on and another group they carried out to a recovery phase in 90 days. So we thought that was a particularly strong study to base the TI on, at least for medical device uh, related exposures. One, it was using a clinically relevant route of exposure. It used a clinically relevant vehicle. You are probably familiar with some of the vehicle effects with DEHP, whether it's from DMSO or ethanol. Uh, maybe affecting lung um, morphology and what have you. So we knew that patients do get this intralipid solution as part of an IV feeding regimen. So we thought that was clinically relevant. Certainly the animal model, or the age at least, was a sensitive subpopulation. And uh, we knew that it covered that very vulnerable period where the male reproductive tract is developing, that gestational day 15 to 17. I think we heard Paul talk about that earlier this morning. So we think that that's an especially good study to base the TI on. My colleagues at the National Center for Toxicological Research, or NCTR, uh, did a similar study and they reported the results at the SOT meeting last year and we were very pleased to see that the NOAL and LOAL tracked very well with the, uh, the values in the CAMAC study. So we have high confidence that that's a good study to, to base the parenteral TI on. Um, so that's really one of the things that makes our safety assessment unique. We've heard about the activities ongoing or uh, forthcoming in IRIS, and certainly the NTP has been very active in this area, but we really focused on effects after parenteral exposure. So what are we doing now? Um, mentioned briefly that we're revising the safety assessment under the auspices of ISO, taking a look at um, the whole range of data, but we found that at least for parenteral exposures, that although there are a number of new oral toxicity studies, there really aren't any parenteral studies that would change our earlier assessment of, of the for the derivation of the TI. Um, but we are including inhalation in this draft, which makes it somewhat unique. We're also going to include a section on how to evaluate the significance of the TI, how to compare the dose to the TI, how much above the TI do we have to go before we start worrying about the potential for adverse effects. So really putting that into context in a, a risk characterization framework. The other thing we're doing is we're revising our exposure assessment, and in fact I have a student working on that right now. So there are a number of new and important studies in the literature, uh, so we're updating that component of the safety assessment. 
We're also conducting some of our own exposure assessment studies, and I'd like to describe three of those to you based on the data gaps that we identified when we did our first exposure assessment. The first of which, we found that there were very poor data on oral exposure to DEHP from enteral feeding tubes. So critically ill patients, particularly critically ill neonates, who were receiving enteral feeding, we found that there was a gap there, and we knew that potential existed for a relatively high dose of DEHP to be uh, administered to these patients uh, only because many of the feeding solutions, the baby formulas, had fat in them that would result in the migration of the DEHP from the, the tubing. So we've done that study. I'm embarrassed to say that's been sitting on my desk and needs to get out as a manuscript, so we're ready to send that in. But we've just started a study literally this week. I was just down talking to our collaborators looking at DEHP exposure in critically ill patients who are getting cardiopulmonary bypass. So there have been one or two other studies in the literature, and Japanese investigators have looked at exposure of patients on cardiopulmonary bypass. But those were, uh, we had uh, plasma levels of DEHP, so it was harder to back extrapolate what the dose was that would have resulted in those plasma levels. In this study, we're going to look at urinary metabolite levels, and we're going to back extrapolate based on the pharmacokinetic models that Dr. Koch and others have developed. Um, I think that will give us a better handle on what the actual doses are. Uh, so th that study is being done with uh, investigators at the Children's National Medical Center here in, in D.C. So in addition to those patients, we're going to have 30 patients on cardiopulmonary bypass. We're also going to have 30 critically ill patients who are in the pediatric ICU who are being treated with PVC medical devices but who will not have cardiopulmonary bypass or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And then there's a third control group of relatively healthy patients who present to the cardiology clinic for various reasons, but there's no reason to expect that they would be exposed to PVC medical devices. So that study is just starting now, and hopefully we'll have some preliminary results by the end of the summer. We hope to move quickly on that. We also have a study looking at DEHP release from hemodialysis circuits, and that's being done in conjunction with investigators at the University of Michigan. And again, that study is just starting as well. So. Based on our earlier exposure study, we recognized that there were some gaps in the literature, especially for patients who are exposed to fairly high doses of DEHP. So relative to a general population exposure, maybe this isn't significant in terms of size, but it certainly is significant in terms of the, the magnitude of the dose. So we felt it was important to do those studies. And then finally, we're at the very early stages of looking at aggregate risk of exposure to DEHP and MEHP. So we typically think of MEHP as the uh, endogenous breakdown product, metabolite of DEHP, but as Dr. Strong showed in her slides, patients can be exposed to not only the parent compound but metabolite from exogenous sources. So for example, with PVC, if it undergoes gamma radiation for sterilization, you can have breakdown of the DEHP to MEHP. It's also true in stored blood in the blood bank. If you have esterases in the plasma, it's going to break down the DEHP released from the bag into uh, the MEHP metabolite. So we've got patients exposed to not only DEHP, but exogenously formed MEHP. So we've had some early thoughts about how to do a cumulative risk assessment for those two. But at least from a device perspective, we have very few exposures to phthalates other than DEHP. So that really gives an overview of where we are with the safety assessment uh, and the, the new exposure assessment and just some of the new exposure studies that we're doing in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. So I'd be glad to try to answer any questions if I could. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> Has the device industry moved away from DEHP as the main plasticizer? We're finding that's true for some devices. For example, I talked about those enteral feeding tubes. I would say almost universally they've gone to silicone tubing. Uh, it's more of a challenge for other devices, and we were talking about cardiopulmonary bypass. I think because of the unique properties that DEHP imparts to that type of tubing, and also I think I, it, it's well known in terms of its uh, hemocompatibility profile, its thrombogenicity. In those devices, they have not moved away from DEHP. Although I do know there's some interest in looking at alternatives like uh, citrate-based plasticizers, TOTM, and uh, there's some discussion about moving to DINCH as well. But we haven't seen those devices yet. <clears throat> what long-term studies are there on these infants that have been uh, 
benefited from some device that has a high level of, P of DEHP that gets transferred into them? What are the long, at least out through adolescence? Mm -hmm. Only one study that I'm aware of, and it's actually a very small study, so I know that Dr. Swan talked about um, many of the general population studies that have been conducted or studies in which the primary route of exposure was oral exposure. It's actually a very small study done at Children's Hospital. Dr. Rice Barami looked at 16 patients who had expo been exposed to relatively high levels of DEHP while they were being treated on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation and then followed them into adolescence. The problem, of course, is that there are so many uh, factors that could result in, in altered reproductive endpoints. In fact, in these 16 patients, they found no difference between those patients and controls. Um, but the sample size was too small to draw any definitive conclusions. I just want to point out that in the Rice Barami study, no exposure was assessed. That is very important. And of course, that's always a, a challenge in uh, exposure studies. And even if it had been assessed, you know, it's difficult to know what exposure as a neonate means 16 or 18 years later when, when those patients are exposed to phthalates from multiple sources throughout that time period. Just just a question out of personal interest. How do you handle the risk-benefit equation for voluntary medical patients like voluntary blood product donors? Plasmapheresis. Plasmapheresis, okay. apheresis, thrombus, right. platelet pheresis. How do you handle this equation for these voluntary patients? That's really done on a device by device basis based on that patient profile. And I don't want to make it seem like I'm sidestepping the, the question, but those devices are regulated by our Center for Biologics. Um, so I haven't been as involved in those types of devices, but uh, it's an important consideration if the exposure is voluntary uh, as opposed to life saving measures like cardiopulmonary bypass. We have not differentiated or we have not taken risk-benefit into account in the derivation of the tolerable intake value. That's strictly a science-based and science-policy-based value, science policy to the extent that we used uncertainty factors. Uh, but it's really up to the risk managers to use that number in making risk-based decisions on individual products. Are you aware of any satellite exposure from other medical devices other than tubing, etc., etc.? Yes. Um, there are some dental devices that will expose patients orally to phthalates, primarily DEHP, but you know, there may be some others as well. Um, Tubing really, though, is overwhelmingly the, the major contributor of exposure, especially tubing that's in contact with lipophilic substances like blood or plasma. I, I probably didn't express myself correctly. Med medical devices is one thing, but, but then drug and drug formulation, drug delivery vehicles, etc., etc. Are you aware of any of this? Actually, I'll defer to my colleagues in the Center for Drugs, but of course, when you have drug formulation vehicles, especially if they're intent is to emulsify or solubilize a lipophilic drug, the potential does exist for those agents to extract phthalates from the tubing and bag. Well, I'm thinking in particular of capsules, of which I show you a quite enlarged version here. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any idea what exposure via these routes is? I don't, and to, we have not investigated that. Don't you think that's a dangerous omission? Well, most of the implanted devices are actually using fairly hard plastic, so it's, not, it's our understanding that phthalate plasticized PVC is not typically used in implanted devices. No, 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 no this is not implanted. It, this is an enlarged version. You just swallow it. It's a pill. Okay, yeah, then I am not personally aware of those we, devices. We have someone from the uh, right. drugs on, on, the, on the, the line. Right. Yeah, I'll address it when I speak. Thank you, Abby. Uh, we've heard a lot, though, about that one of the primary exposures can also be from food. 
uh, is the FDA involved in all in looking at phthalates in food? I'm going to defer to my colleagues from the Center for Foods to yeah. answer that. In terms of the exposure study, what, what are your goals there? I mean, is it to define range of exposure, the highest exposures? Because I know there are s such studies in the literature. Um, and then the second part of that question is, would you be collecting any potential health outcome information, such as, you know, a blood sample to look at liver function tests in the neonates or bilirubin, something like that? that in the plans as well. So the goal of the study is to not look at health endpoints, but we are going to look at liver enzymes just to make sure there are no, uh, there's no underlying liver disease that might affect the metabolism of DEHP. We're also looking at bisphenol A as well. I didn't want to necessarily raise that to this committee, but we're trying to catch a, cast a wider net. Um, in terms of the goals are, are both to characterize the, the range of exposures as well as, as the upper bounds uh, to the extent that we can with 30 patients. Um, they, will have, they, they won't be entirely homogeneous in terms of the procedures, but for the most part, the patients on cardiopulmonary by, bypass do go through a certain regimen of procedures, so there'll be s some variability, but maybe not much. But, we're going to try to capture that to the extent that we can, similar to what Dr. Califat did in looking at binning the patients into medium, uh, high, low, medium, and high exposures based on uh, device use other than cardiopulmonary bypass. The and, and you, excuse me. Yeah, the NICU uh, of study. You we, are the prime, yeah. And we actually have, right. um, well, we have samples now from about 50 NICU babies that we're right. going to be looking at in addition, you know, a separate study looking at phthalates and BPA as well. So we're hoping, you know, whenever we get the data, it'll be published relatively soon. Right. So your study's obviously been very useful in the design of the study and really serve as a roadmap for our efforts. And it was, if I remember, you did not look at kids with cardiopulmonary bypass, so we wanted to address right. that. Yeah. yeah, correct. We did not. And the, the other thing that we did in our study, too, the, the, the recent one that's not published yet, is trying to determine um, if the exposures are coming primarily from the medical devices, the feedings, et cetera, because a lot of the NICU babies, you know, are receiving supplementation, you know, formula or um, uh, extra nutrition, which, you know, basically they could be getting their exposures through other sources. So how are you considering that or just are you collecting that information as we well? We are, and we've, we think we've, been fairly comprehensive in developing a database a priori to look at some of the factors. Although it's a challenge for DEHP, it's maybe even more of a challenge for bisphenol A in trying to keep track of, you know, what baby bottles do they use, uh, those types of things, what kind of formula. So, um, you know, we tried to, to build on your work uh, as a basis for this study. Any other questions? Thank you, Ron. Um, uh, next, we have uh, Don Havery from the Center for, uh, or the Office of Cosmetics and Colors. Did you find that uh, slots on this side? Oh, yeah. Thank you.
That's the guy. Oh, okay, hold on. Ah. This one? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this afternoon, just for a few minutes, I'm going to describe for you the information that we have collected on phthalates in cosmetic products uh, since our, we started working on this in 2002. Uh, I'll talk a just briefly about our regulatory authority because that has an impact on the, the information that we have on cosmetics. I'll talk about the phthalates that are used. And then I'll focus primarily on the surveys that we've conducted since 2002. I'll talk briefly about exposure assessment and finally our conclusions and uh, our future plans. Uh, first off, our regulatory authority. Um, we have no pre-market approval for cosmetic products. There's no mandatory safety testing. There's no mandatory submission of any safety testing and no mandatory reporting of those safety tests to FDA. We can ask for it during an inspection, but a manufacturer is not required to give us that information. So as a result of the regulations that we operate under, the regulation of cosmetics is entirely post-market. We have as much information on what is on the market as you do when you go to your grocery store and look at the foods uh, or the cosmetic aisle in the, in the food store. Uh, that being said, however, manufacturers are responsible to assure that their products are safe. They uh, are responsible for conducting tests, although the FDA does not tell them what tests to conduct. And uh, of course, then they have to conduct any additional research that they think is necessary in order to assure that the products are safe. These are the phthalates that we know are used in cosmetics, uh, the dimethyl, diethyl, dibutyl, benzylbutyl. And, and I, I raise another point just for your information. There is about 25 other phthalate derivatives that are listed in the International Cosmetic Ingredient Dictionary. I listed a few there just as an example. These are higher molecular weight phthalates, so I don't know if they impact uh, on what you're doing, but just so you know, they're out there. In cosmetics, phthalates function either as a fragrance, solvent, primarily the, di the diethyl uh, phthalate is the best known solvent, a plasticizer, the dibutyl phthalates, the best plasticizer in cosmetics, and occasionally as a denaturant. The FDA does have a voluntary cosmetic registration program. We don't really know what part of the market this program captures. We estimate right now it's about one-third, um, but we don't really know since there's no pre-market approval and we don't know what's on the market. But just to give you an idea of the distribution of phthalates that we have filed in our program, we have only three products, and they're all hair products with dimethyl phthalate. The bulk of the products are diethyl phthalate, and these are uh, uh, in, a, in a variety of different types of products. The dibutyl phthalate uh, is almost exclusively in nail products, and we currently have no products uh, filed with benzyl butyl phthalate. Now I'll talk a little bit about our surveys, and I, I can tell you that at least this survey is published, and I can give you a reference uh, for that. The second survey has uh, been submitted for publication. Uh, we've done three surveys. The first survey was in 2002 and 2003, where we surveyed 48 products, and 67% of those products had at least one phthalate in it. And I should tell you that it's going to be hard to remember the numbers, so when I'm done here, I'll, I'll show you some trends that we've seen uh, uh, over the years. Uh, as you might expect, the diethyl phthalate is found most frequently, uh, it, it being an effective fragrance solvent, and we think it's there primarily because of the fragrance. 
Um, it's found uh, in m just about all products. I'm not sure why we didn't see it in shampoo, probably just uh, because of the random draw of picking a, par a product or two from the market that didn't have it. Uh, you can see that the range is quite substantial, uh, going up to uh, almost 4% uh, with an average of about 3,000 parts per million. The dibutyl phthalate was found in a number of different products, na typically nail polish, hairspray, mousse, any place where you would want some kind of a plastic effect, uh, um, either on the hair or uh, on your nails. Uh, the range in nail polish was also quite variable, uh, and it was found up to 6%, which is not, not surprising. That's typical for a nail polish. The dimethyl phthalate was found in three products, all nail polish, and the benzyl butyl phthalate was found in one hairspray. We conducted a similar survey a couple years later in collecting products that were on the market between 06 and 08. We surveyed 60 products. This time we decided to include baby products since that became the po focus in the literature of an issue. We uh, found 52% of the products had at least one phthalate. Again, diethyl phthalate was found most frequently, but this time only in 35% of the products. Uh, uh, similar to the previous survey, we, s we found nearly 4% in the fragrance, so uh, there wasn't much reformulation going on in the fragrance products. Dibutyl phthalate was only found in nail polishes in this second survey. Again, there had been some reformulation going on, um, but again, levels as high as, uh, high as roughly 6%. In the second survey, we could not find dimethyl phthalate or benzyl butyl phthalate. In that second survey, the baby products we looked at, uh, 24 products of, of a variety of shampoos, body washes, creams, lotions, and oils. Uh, we found diethyl phthalate in five of those, uh, the highest up to 274 parts per million. Um, diethyl phthalate most likely there because of fragrance. Our last survey, which we just completed, was done under contract. So these data are preliminary. Um, we tried to maximize the, the, uh, the contract by doing single point analyses. So we need to go back and rerun some of these samples in our own laboratory to confirm them before uh, we're certain of the data and before we can publish it. But this is uh, our preliminary data. We, we surveyed nearly 200 products in this survey, and we also uh, uh, included baby and children's products. In this last survey, 23% of the products had at least one phthalate. Again, diethyl phthalate was found most frequently, this time in 18% of the products. And dibutyl phthalate was only found in 14% of the nail products. There's clearly been uh, some reformulating going on. In the, the uh, baby and children's products, we included 49 products of a variety of products you can see there. Diethyl phthalate was found in only five of them at uh, levels up to 390 parts per million. Now I'll try to put it all together a little bit in focus, the trends that we've seen since 2002. Uh, it's, uh, if you look at uh, products with at least one phthalate, it's pretty clear that the trend is down. The cosmetic industry has been reformulating phthalates out of their products. Uh, the percentage of uh, dibutyl phthalate in nail enamels has uh, almost gone to zero, if you look at that, those numbers. Um, the highest we found was seven parts per million in a nail enamel. And I have to throw in one caveat here. Cosmetic products have a shelf life of two to three years. So when we go out and buy products for surveys, we don't really know how long they've been on the shelf. Um, so for these trend date on this last uh, slide here, they may have been on the market no seven. So some of these higher numbers, if we were to run out and buy samples today, they might not be that high. It's a little bit difficult to know exactly what's on the market 
at any particular point in time because of that shelf life issue. For that reason, we intend to have to run another survey uh, two years down the road to see if the trend continues. Um, and I make that uh, point primarily for the fragrance products. If you look at the trend, it's clearly down. Uh, only half of the products that we looked at had uh, diethyl phthalate. And these, these are fragrance products like perfume, not uh, a fragranced cosmetic product. So the high that we saw still of about 4% in the product in the products we just looked at may have been a product that was put on the market in, uh, two years ago and may have been reformulated at this point in time. So a summary of our observations and our surveys. Uh, certainly the frequency of use of phthalates in cosmetics is declining. The, the use of dibutyl phthalate in nail products has significantly declined. Frequency of use of diethyl phthalate has also declined and, and uh, who knows in, in two years time it also may be non-existent. The diethyl phthalate concentration, however, in some products may be still high, but we don't know. We don't really know what those, uh, those uh, pieces of data mean until we conduct another survey and confirm it. Just uh, a point of information, uh, two exposure assessments that we're aware of. Uh, you probably are familiar with the Cosmetic Ingredient Review. This is an industry-supported group of scientists and physicians who review the safety of cosmetic ingredients. They reviewed the safety of phthalates uh, in 2003, and this is published, by the way. As part of that uh, review, they did an exposure estimate to dibutyl phthalate, and they assumed four cosmetic products were used at one time, nail polish, hairspray, deodorant, and perfume. They used a dibutyl phthalate concentration of 15%, which is w way out of sight now compared to what appears to be on the market nowadays. Um, they used a skin absorption of 5%, which is uh, data from uh, a mint publication in 94 and nail absorption of eight and a half percent which was obtained from the cosmetic industry and they calculated a total exposure of about nine micrograms per kilogram per day so that number though based on our current survey data is going to be a whole lot lower because a good deal of that exposure comes from the nail product we uh, also calculated exposure from cosmetic, uh, from frag a fragrance product, again, a perfume in 2005. We had measured 3.9% of diethyl phthalate in a fragrance, so we used that number. We also knew that the skin absorption was about 4.7%, again, from the mint paper, and we calculated about 16 micrograms per kilogram per day. So our, our conclusions based on our work since O2, um, there's been a significant reduction in both the frequency of use and the concentration of use in phthalates uh, in cosmetics. Dibutyl phthalate appears to have been removed from most nail products, so exposure from cosmetics now is extremely low. The diethyl phthalate frequency of use is declining we are not quite sure yet if the concentration of use, uh, uh, clearly it's going down uh, in most products. Uh, again, because we don't know w what that data point meant and whether it was a current market product, it's a little bit hard to say exactly if uh, all fragrance manufacturers have removed the diethyl phthalate or reduced it in their products. We plan to continue to monitor the research on health effects of phthalates, and um, we're certainly going to need to conduct another survey, at least one more, uh, in two years' time to uh, find out what current levels are and to see if the downward trend continues. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the panel? Um, I have two questions. Thank you for your comments. Um, my first question is when you talk about surveying products, uh, how do you select the, the products 
uh, for the survey? Is it, is it in some way a random sample or uh, are they chosen by market share? Or, I mean, how do you, it's how completely do you random. So you go to the, your local CVS and say? Just start pulling. Start pulling. It, it's unfortunate, again, because of our regulatory authority and our lack of knowledge of what's out there. But we really don't know, so we just pull them randomly. Um, but that's our only option. Um, and also, when you say that the products are being, uh, you know, reduced in their uses for certain things like fragrance or something, do you have a sense of what's replaced, what's been used to replace them, or have you looked into that at all? A couple of years ago, when when uh, we met uh, at a meeting with some fragrance industry folks, they told me that diethyl phthalate was a perfect fragrance solvent, and they were very reluctant to remove it. But they did say that they were studying two alternatives. Uh, we haven't looked to see if those are the two that that have replaced uh, the diethyl phthalate. Um, but no, they're not phthalates. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't even remember what they were, but they were not phthalates. Okay, well, my question, uh, when they list ingredients on cosmetics, is that strictly voluntary? And since I never see phthalates listed, is that because they're generally part of the fragrance or considered part of the fragrance? Yeah, that's exactly right. By regulation, fragrance ingredients can be listed as fragrance that's because there could be three or four hundred chemicals in a fragrance and you wouldn't be able to fit it on a bottle. So when the labeling regulations were created, that was the argument made for just using that word fragrance in place of all those other names, which wouldn't mean anything to anybody anyway. Yeah, well, most of the <laughs> ingredients in shampoo are, don't mean much either. <laughs> but... Uh, um, Okay, so it's it's because it's it, and even though it's not a fragrance itself, it, but it is part of the fragrance. If it's part of the fragrance, yes. But if, for example, they were using dibutyl phthalate in a nail enamel, that would have to be listed on the labeling label okay, as so an ingredient. You would see that. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So there's no chance of changing that. That regulation? Not unless you want to buy a, a 10 gallon bottle of shampoo so they'd have enough room. <laughs> you know, even just with an asterisk, you know, in this list of fragrance, it could include or it does include phthalates that blah, blah, blah. I can't imagine. Well, I imagine they, I suppose they could do that, but I've never heard anyone suggest that, no. It appears that they want to take it out based on our surveys, so. Or, I mean, I thought it would, was more because the fragrances were a trade secret, but... Uh, certainly that was probably part of it. Um, when those regulations uh, were being developed, the fragrance industry uh, did not want to divulge that information. Uh, any more questions? Holger? You only analyzed the low molecular weight phthalates. Did you also analyze the EHP, DINP in those products? Um, we, well, those other, those phthalates that I listed are the only ones that would be in a cosmetic product. Um, and as a certain purpose in it, yes. But uh, we know from food stuff that uh, some phthalates can accumulate in the fatty fraction. So if I would assume that uh, during the production of chapstick lipstick solution some 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 creams there might be an accumulation of other phthalates like DHP and known phthalate during the process. So I would be interested in the content of in these products because mm -hmm. if you would assume you use chapstick lipstick every day there might be significant oral uptake. 
mm -hmm. this way. So that would be interesting. It's, it's a good question. A chapstick would be a drug, mm -hmm. however, but lipstick would be uh, uh, would be a cosmetic. But you're right. Um, it would not be listed on the label yeah. because it was part of the manufacturing process. Uh, it, we could look at our data. We have the spectra just to see if there was any other phthalates there. Um, it's probably a good idea to do that. In the, the surveys, you said they're published. Is, is that in the literature or uh, on your website? or? It's not on our website. The first survey's already been published. That's in the, inter uh, the Journal of Cosmetic Science. The second survey was, pub was submitted to the same journal. Um, so it will probably come out next year. Um, okay, can you send us a site for the, the first one? I can give you a copy of that paper. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Abby, are you still with us? I'm still with you. Uh, could you t please tell us what's going on in uh, the uh, Center for Drug Evaluation? Yes, okay. Uh, we were asked if we could make some kind of an estimate of what the exposure is to phthalates through pharmaceuticals. For pharmaceuticals, none of them have DEHP. One still has dibutyl phthalate and it's being reformulated. However, quite a few have diethyl phthalate as part of sustained release and delayed release products. However, these products were not thought to have toxicity at the amounts being used, so there was no, there's been no effort to make suggest that people reformulate them, although they can reformulate them on their own. Other phthalates used are not alkyl phthalates. Actually, most of the phthalates currently used are cellulose esters, such as hypromellose phthalate. The interest from CPSC seemed to be for the alkyl phthalates, so we focused on the diethyl phthalates, for which we have a number of products. We actually know exactly how much and of what phthalates are in all prescription products. It's not publicly available. We identified all prescription drugs that contain phthalates, and we know the exact amounts. So one idea is that we can determine the number of prescriptions written for these 20 or so drugs that contain amounts of about one milligram or more per unit dose of ethyl phthalate, and with knowing the prescription numbers and the amounts in a drug, you can get an estimate of the exposure. This information could also be stratified by age or any other way that, you, that um, the people making the risk estimate would like it to be stratified. So I'd say this has been our uh, plan. We hadn't really done anything before because it hadn't been considered to be a safety issue. So are there any questions or suggestions about what kind of information you would like us to, to derive from what we have? Um, questions from the panel? Yes. Would you? Any questions? I mean, we've, I, I figured out the 20 or so drugs that have the diethyl phthalate in it at, at a level that would be of interest. And we can determine the number of prescriptions written, and that information could be stratified. Would you like it stratified by age? Any other way you would like it to be stratified when we get this information? And it doesn't take a year to get it either. Well, I'm, I'm thinking, do we need diethyl? Do you need it at all? Okay, I, I see a yes. Okay, go ahead. I just wanted to confirm that uh, there's just one medication left with dibutyl phthalate in it. Yes. What has been the situation, let's say, five years ago? Uh, there were just a couple more. That would be highly interesting because that's the current uh, biomonitoring data from the fourth report. So mm -hmm. that would be interesting to know the situation in it had the to year do with the, uh, three in 2004. The enzymes that uh, children with cystic fibrosis have to take large amount of enzymes to, uh, for digestion. 
and so it's it's given slow release and protected from immediate digestion. But they take lots of it. So they, a number of those had diabetal phthalate in them. They've pretty much been all reformulated. There's one product left. And it's in the process of being reformulated. Did you tell they, us which product? No. That's confidential. <laughs> uh, can, can you tell us the class of drug or any, give us a hint? Uh, it's for the GI. Okay. When I give the 20 or so drugs, I can tell you if it's in for, for neurology indication, cardiorenal, because the exact amounts for a particular drug is confidential information. Um, can I ask specifically about those uh, capsules for, for release in the stomach? Um, I don't know, I look at this situation from a European perspective. Uh, are you sure these capsules don't contain any uh, higher molecular weight phthalates? I mean, the hypomellose phthalates, the, the cellulose esters of phthalates, they do, yes. They're not considered alkyl phthalates. But you know, like DEHP, DINP? No, none of them do. And they would have to report this to you if they did? We have the exact composition of every prescription drug. Okay. All components, all recipients. Including the uh, inert ingredients. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And, oh, go ahead. I was going to ask, you, you mentioned the cellulose, and I think there's the vinyl acetate. and. Yeah, there's a, there's a cellulose acetate phthalate, too, right. We, we have those. That, the original request was to look at alkyl phthalates. Are um, alkyl phthalates used to make those in their manufacture? I don't know. In manufacturing? I haven't looked into the manufacturing. I'm just wondering if they were, then they may be present in the polymer. I'm not sure that they are. I, I don't know. I'm just asking. Well, the amount of the impurities are going to be small compared to the amount of phthalate you actually have from these 20 drugs. We're talking about a milligram per unit dose or more. And when these drugs talking are about parts per million. When these drugs are reformulated, I mean, is that a process that takes months or years or? or it depends on how much trouble we're having. It, it can be compatibility issues. Depends on the product. Does it go through formal review? I don't. I don't know the process. Absolutely, it goes through formal review. Okay. Well, I I would think that if these are mainly like timed release or enteric coated, then they would have to at least do some kind of bioavailability. Well, they have to make sure that it really is what it claims to be, and it has to be equivalent to what they had before so that they don't have to do new clinical studies. Yeah, and I guess we can ask the same question uh, as we did for cosmetics. Do you know what the substitutes are? These other cellular phthalates, uh, they, they were replacing methacrylate esters before. No, A lot so, of so, so if they're taking out dibutyl or diethyl, what are they replacing them with? The hypomellose phthalates. Okay. Or you can have methacrylate polymers, which so have their own set of toxicities. They're replacing them with polymers. Other polymers, yes. Yeah. It's always going to be a polymer for the delayed release, sustained release. Okay. Now, the, the polymeric ones, uh, oh, uh, the polymeric phthalates, uh, do you know, it, it, are they designed to hydrolyze? Is that part of the release mechanism, or are they supposed to stay intact? Do you, do you know that? Well, they're supposed to stay intact, depending on what the product is, usually the the sustained release means it's gradually, it's little by little release, and then there's those that you want to get all the way through the stomach to the intestine. Yeah. You don't want any degradation at all in the stomach. 
Yeah, I'm just wondering what what happens to the uh, um, uh, conjugate, the cellulose phthalate. Yeah. Does it lose phthalate groups or something? I'm sure. Well, cellulose itself isn't degraded very well in the in the human. Right. But the phthalate, there. I mean, there there can be esterases. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering if if, if it can release phthalates as it it slowly releases the drug. I'm wondering if the the these compounds. Well, it's all like acid. Well. If that's what it is, that wouldn't be so bad, I guess. Okay. Um. Are you discussing both over-the-counter and prescription? This. Um, the times on prescription. Originally, when we did a search in the literature, it suggested that um, there were some patents for using phthalates for aspirin ibuprofen. But when I looked up the actual composition of uh, the large suppliers of it, they were not using the, the uh, diethyl phthalate. They had other Walgreens. I looked up Walgreens. I looked up Walmart. I looked at bottles in the store. I didn't see any. And it had the composition. They had other compositions. There was no diethyl phthalate. How about supplements and nutraceuticals, or is that included? That's in not regulated by as drugs. That would be uh, regulated by uh, foods. Sitsan. You don't have anybody from foods. You just have the cosmetics person. Um. I don't know why it would be in a dietary supplement. I don't, well, uh, I guess for the same reasons it might be in a drug to slow release or delay release. I, I we, we don't regulate those, so yeah, I yeah. didn't look it up. Uh, let's see. Um, but if, if we were to pursue the exposure data on diethyl phthalate. Uh -huh. I'm um, asking the panel what kind of form would we want those data uh, stratified or how to stratify it, it or is this something we need to maybe think about for a few days? I actually have somebody, there's somebody on the phone this is Stephen Chang. Yeah, he's on the phone. He, he can do any search you want. <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, panel. I guess um, we're just trying to figure out if, if there are some age groups, uh, if you're looking more for adults versus um, pediatrics, or if you're looking for gender or and ages. There's uh, many couple of ways that you can sort of acquire this information. So there's also some other things you can look at, too, but I just wanted to see what um, kind of are your thoughts. Um, well, this is Mike. Uh, I think that there are probably more than one way that the panel would be interested in because we likely will be looking at general population as well as um, uh, women and uh, neonates or uh, um, uh, pediatric uses. So uh, maybe we'll get back to you on the specifics. Um, uh, well, neonates would not be having sustained release, slow release. They'd be getting IV formulations. Right, right, yeah. So look at um, less than one years of age if you still needed that broken out. Um, if that would be useful. Okay. Well, I mean, it's it's right now. Uh, it's useful to know that you have the data and that you can do this. And I think when. Uh, We'll spend a little more time uh, deciding exactly what it is that we need before we uh, ask you to do the analysis. Good. I didn't know if you, you you were thinking about duration or how long people use these for as well. I didn't, well, I didn't know if that yeah. would be useful too. Yeah, we're, we're thinking about that and have to 
think up what 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 other things we might want to consider. Would would your list also include uh, things like inhalers? They're used yeah. by asthmatics. They don't have any uh, phthalates in them. The delivery. Can you list some products? Well, we can look into that. But if there were products that include, you know, we could look up asthmatic inhalers or the delivery system. Because I know there's there's some data that hasn't been published showing that um, asthmatics have higher urinary MEP MEHP. Well, they can they can get things from the mouthpiece of the inhaler. Yeah, that that's what I'm asking. But this, it, so that would be a hard plastic, not a soft plastic. Well, there's a ring in there. But with, with I did, within your we did a search. No. We did a search of all products that contain phthalates, and no inhalation products came up. Okay. We have an da internal database that, that lists all products and all excipients and the amounts of all excipients. Okay. So would these uh, inert ingredients be listed in the... Um, uh, the PDR? Yes. Or the uh, package inserts? Yes. So if something had a phthalate, it would be listed there? Yes. It doesn't tell you the amount. It has it in the order of okay. how much is there, but not what it is. When something is generic, you don't find it in the PDR with the composition. I have a general question back I asked a few minutes ago, but I may be on the wrong track myself, and Holger, maybe this is a question to you, is in my head I keep thinking that we've heard that food is, a, is, a, is an important source of exposure to phthalates, and if that's the case, maybe we need a food person from the <laughs> FDA to speak to us, um, because um, I don't have a good sense of... Yeah. Uh, when you well, say food, food where does uh, FDA or uh, the other option would be to try and find someone at uh, agriculture uh, just, just to see if there's anyone there who has any data or interest in this. Because we're taking food as different than medicine. I mean, this is yeah. food as in usual use of food, right? Okay. Well, the amounts are going to be small compared to pharmaceuticals, actually. What, what particular food would you think you would be exposed to phthalates? Well, I think we think that uh, mostly fatty foods, uh, but we've seen, you know, study after study suggesting that the diet is the major <laughs> source of exposure for many of the phthalates. And it's not clear how it gets in the food whether it's packaging or processing or or environmental but that seems to be the the way it gets into our bodies so do we have an idea of who we could talk to maybe at another meeting about that uh yeah we can we can we can try the the foods uh people uh weren't able to be here today but we can uh can certainly get in touch with them and uh, we could try uh, agriculture although I don't know if they necessarily uh, would have someone but we can certainly ask uh, the, the one other question I had I, I would think that it would be food, uh, FDA foods and not agriculture because they actually look at indirect additives and what comes out of packaging okay um, although it's it's not entirely clear that it's just from the packaging so anyway um, I, I guess the other question I had is do we need uh, should we be talking to uh, someone from biologicals or or uh, are there any other federal agencies uh, we should be should have on the phone I mean we we've had conversations between the staff and CDC um, uh, we haven't spoken to uh, OSHA or NIOSH um, but that's something to think about for maybe future meetings is um, uh, other potential sources of information 
well, biologic, the, the, the blood products would be in contact, could be in contact with soft plastic. That would be in CBER. Vaccines are there, but other biologics are in Center for Drugs. And you're certainly welcome to contact representatives of the Center yeah. for Biologics. We have, in our exposure assessment, we've incorporated those devices in, yeah, in into the ours, blood. but we can still give you some names. Well, that, okay. you know, I think that's probably, well, it's up to the chap. And, and Any other questions for the panel? Well, thank you very much for uh, making your way here on a, on a day with a, uh, without the benefit of traffic lights. And, and thank you, Abby. Abby's on the phone because she uh, just came from another meeting and uh, wouldn't have been able to drive over here. But thank you very much. So, so we'll let us know if you want more information. Yeah, we'll, we'll let you know uh, uh, before you, we send you off doing something and then change our minds. Okay. Is there anything else you want to be looked up? Uh, I, I think for now we're, we're good. Okay. Just let us know or me know. Thank you. Well, uh, again, I want to thank everyone for their contributions. This has been really quite helpful. And uh, I think we're saturated now with <laughs> the <Yeah>. input. <laughs> and my brain is rebelling. So it's, and it's also 5 p.m., so I think we ought to, uh, unless there's some other business, we ought to adjourn. Okay, and we'll reconvene at 8, 8, 8 tomorrow? 8 a.m. tomorrow, yes. Again, thank you all.